and welcome everybody. My name is Naveen Shaker and I am from the Commission's Office of Energy Market Regulation. We are happy to welcome you again today to the second day of this two-day technical conference to discuss resource adequacy developments in the Western interconnection. Thanks again to all the speakers who participated yesterday. Today we will host panels three and four of the conference and conclude with some closing remarks. Today's session will last from 12.30 p.m. Eastern to approximately 5 p.m. Eastern time. We will have a 15 minute break in between panel three and four. After the panel ends, we will have closing remarks from the commissioners to conclude the conference. Please note that this conference is being webcast via Capital Connection and transcribed and recorded for future viewing. Finally, we do not intend to discuss the specific details or merits of any pending contested proceedings before the commission. And we ask that all participants refrain from direct discussion of those matters. If anybody happens on to such topics, my colleague Colin Beckman from the Office of General Counsel might interject to ask the speaker to avoid that topic. With those logistical matters out of the way, we can get into panel three right now. And it's entitled Solutions and Pathways to Addressing Shared Resource Adequacy Needs. We'll begin this segment with brief opening remarks from panelists lasting up to three minutes each, after which we will enter question and answer sessions with um, the chairman and the commissioners. I will now call on each panelist to give their opening remarks. First, we will have Michelle Beck, who is director of the Utah Office of Consumer Services. Please go ahead, Ms. Beck. Thank you, and good morning, at least morning to most of you. As you know, my name is Michelle Beck, and I'm the director of the Utah Office of Consumer Services. Our office is authorized by statute as the consumer advocate in Utah, and we represent residential and small commercial customers of public utilities. I'd like to thank the Commission for the invitation to participate and echo my colleague Bryce Freeman for his gratitude to the Commission and staff for specifically reaching out to the consumer advocates in the West. Also, I need to give the standard caveat that my views I present today are my own and do not represent the state of Utah or my office. With that, I will focus my opening remarks on resource adequacy solutions from the end user perspective. Individual customers care a lot about resource adequacy. They may not fully understand the complexity, but of course they want to be able to flip a switch and have their lights or electronics or appliance turn on. And electric service is essential to supporting both life and our economy. And it is my experience that most consumer advocates and large CNI groups have a strong interest in resource adequacy. Yet it is one more example of where we are hindered by asymmetric access to data and information. For many years, some of us have been raising questions in resource plans about whether these plans have an over-reliance on front office transaction. In some cases, certain regional or national reports have been supplied as evidence designed to demonstrate that the market is deep enough and liquid enough to support the planned level of purchases. But over time, we've gained more understanding of the limitation of those, of those studies, yet have had a difficult time making a case for a different standard um, until now that the, that the issue is more urgent. Conversely, as ratepayers, we don't want to promote that infamous gold plating stand system. And with all the other issues causing rate pressures, today we don't want to support new investments that aren't necessary to run a safe and reliable system. But as one of the panelists described yesterday, it is nearly impossible to challenge any uh, case when a utility asserts safety or reliability. So what are the solutions? In my opinion, good solutions will have the following three characteristics at a minimum. First, cover as broad a region as possible. Second, have independent oversight. And third, facilitate broad stakeholder participation, both through transparent processes and access to data. You heard a lot yesterday about broad participation. I think independent oversight has received less attention. I support the idea that systems and organizations be allowed to develop differently in the West and do not suggest that an independent board necessarily provides the best oversight or is the only solution. However, resource adequacy and other planning processes must be not be done in a matter that cedes all control to the utilities. I acknowledge the difficulties in meeting the needs of states and provinces with widely varying energy policy, as well as challenges addressing different systems associated with public power as compared to investor-owned utilities. Yet transparent and robust stakeholder processes must be seen as a core principle. 
Over the past decade, I have been disappointed to see it observe a trend away from broad stakeholder participation. And even in some forms with robust processes, consumer advocates have often specifically not been included. So in conclusion, I suggest that proper oversight and rob robust stakeholder participation will strengthen any resource adequacy and planning initiatives and advance the goals of better transparency and access to information and hopefully lead to better trust among the key participants. I look forward to the questions and the continuing conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Beck, for those comments. Up next, we will have Commissioner Tammy Cordova from the Nevada Public Utilities Commission. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning for me and good afternoon for some of you, uh, Chairman Glick, Commissioners, and other colleagues. My name is Tammy Cordova, and I'm a commissioner with the Public Utilities Commission of Nevada. I appreciate the opportunity today to share my perspective on some of what Nevada is doing regarding resource adequacy. As a state regulator, reliable service is a primary concern, and in Nevada, we are doubling down on regionalization. Nevada has climate and clean energy goals that have been outlined as part of the state energy policy by the Nevada governor and the Nevada state legislature, including a 50% renewable portfolio standard by 2030. Given our carbon-free goals, improving regional engagement with our neighbors on the topic of resource adequacy appears to make very good sense. Following the tight conditions in August of 2020, the Nevada Commission conducted an investigation regarding resource adequacy and issued a report that's now avail available on the Nevada Commission's website. Nevada currently has an integrated resource planning process for our electric utilities, and currently our largest utilities rely on imports to ensure reliable service. One very challenging problem in planning for resource adequacy is the lack of transparency and information sharing that currently occurs across our region. Last August, during several hours, imports were unexpectedly curtailed and not delivered. Although Nevada did not experience any service interruptions as a result, it was much tighter than we would have liked. It's not possible for us to reasonably assess the risk of our utilities portfolio without adequate information. Resource planning and forecasting is becoming more granular and sensitive due to the changing nature of intermittent resources, changes in weather, and in demand. This is tough stuff, but the tools do exist to plan differently. I'm not going to go as far as to say we all need to plan in the same way, but regional planning needs better data in order to be more robust. As discussed yesterday, WEC does what it can with the resources it can, but WEC receives utility and state planning information in ways that creates challenges. I'm aware that there's concerns about confidentiality and proprietary information, but having a disinterested party doing data collection and forecasting across state lines has become a priority. Nevada is located at somewhat of a crossroads between California and other Western states. Given our geography and physical interconnection, the vast majority of our energy imports currently travel through California. CAISO is currently the market in which Nevada participates in the only real organized market in the West. Nevada's member of CAISO's EIM, and Nevada ratepayers have significantly benefited from that participation. Unfortunately, due to its governance issues, CAISO is a California construct. The only viable regional market being a state-specific entity creates challenges in many of the areas that we are discussing today. Communication, information sharing, transparency around resources. For example, one of our challenges in Nevada centers around the WSPP Schedule C contract commonplace in Nevada. These are expected to be firm contracts, yet there were significant curtailments last August of these contracts. Unfortunately, I do not know if the WSPP contracts are sourced from a physical asset or the market or a firm transmission is available. The damage payments are not an adequate remedy in tight energy and capacity conditions, and planning is impossible if firm does not mean firm. Reliable and adequate service cannot be achieved regionally if there's no way for a state commission to know the curtailment risk of a WSPP Schedule C contract. No one in the West currently has the authority and ability to access and share data across the region to ensure we're not double counting resources, to ensure we're able to access regional planning instead of being limited to local planning, and to ensure we have a regional plan for interstate communication in times of high demand. Different states peak at different times, different states have dissimilar resource mixes, and different states have different goals for energy particularly here in the West, that is very, very uh, clear. 
we can find an efficient way to work cooperatively together, compile and access all of this information, empowering a regional entity with great with authority to gather more interstate data does not require my commission to cede our Nevada specific resource planning authority. The Nevada legislature recently passed legislation that requires every transmission provider in Nevada to join a regional transmission organization before 2030 or to obtain a waiver of this requirement. The bill also created a Nevada Regional Transmission Coordination Task Force. And finally, the Nevada legislature and the Nevada Commission are supporting the construction of large transmission investments in Nevada. Our largest electric utility, NV Energy, has information about these plans on its website. Major new transmission infrastructure in the crossroads of Nevada creates another opportunity for the Western Interconnection to overcome some of our regionalization hurdles. I appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts on this very important topic, and I look forward to the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Commissioner. Up next, we will hear from Sarah Edmonds, who is Director of Transmission and Market Services at Portland General Electric Company. Ms. Edmonds, please go ahead. Thanks, Naveen. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Edmonds, Director of Transmission and Market Policy for Portland General Electric. Thank you to the chair, the commissioners, and all of the staff for organizing this vital conversation. A little about Portland General. We're an Oregon utility serving our customers with a diverse mix. That includes hydropower, gas, wind and solar, and key transmission and distribution assets. Last year, we retired the Boardman Coal Plant, the last of its kind in Oregon. And like a lot of other Western utilities, we're pursuing aggressive decarbonization goals in order to provide our customers with safe, reliable, affordable and clean energy solutions. I'm gonna focus my time today on solutions we're pursuing in the West to address resource adequacy or RA, specifically in the context of the structure and governance for a future regional RA program through the Northwest Power Pool. Yesterday, you heard from Greg, Greg Carrington, Frank Lawson and Mark Holman about the Westwide effort underway to stand up a first of its kind utility driven voluntary regional RA planning and compliance program. You also heard about why utilities across the West are leading this work. We are seeing the need to address a very serious reliability issue in the West. And we believe that in order to meet our goals, we've got to take advantage of all of the system diversity benefits that are available to us as a region. How we set this program up is critical to its future success, and it's well known in the West that RTO attempts have, have really faltered over questions around governance and control. So like the great success story of the energy imbalance market, we are pursuing a regional RA framework using an incremental approach that employs innovation, creativity, some out of the box thinking, but which honors regional choice, and if it's successful, puts the Northwest Power Pool footprint in a substantially improved place in terms of having a unified, consistent picture of planning reserve needs for that footprint, something we do not have today. One of the major structural challenges we face is that our effort is voluntary. Resource adequacy obligations are clearly the responsibility of utilities, but it's not as clear for load service under retail competition programs. And this was discussed uh, a little bit yesterday by Mr. Holman. My time is brief. I look forward to questions, but in short, here are some of the fundamental concepts driving our structural and governance considerations for the Northwest Power Pool. An independent board is a central consideration. We don't have to reinvent all the wheels. EIM offers a lot. We're seriously considering use of a multi-sector nominating committee to identify qualified independent board members for this future organization. Forums like the Energy Imbalance Market Regional Issues Forum, the EIM body of state regulators allow for the positions of regulators and various stakeholders to be taken into consideration as the program evolves over time. And evolution is also a key concept here. We're also working with Western Interstate Energy Board to engage in discussions with state regulators about their role in the future regional RA program. That conversation starts as early as tomorrow. But from the very, very beginning of our work, we established a multi-sector stakeholder advisory committee with broad invites across the region, comprised of state interests and other stakeholders to create a feedback loop and opportunity. And we're looking to see how we can use that same structure to continue for the future program. Finally, 
As one of the leaders working on making this program a success, we recognize that the benefits of a regional program can only be adequately captured if we govern it in a manner that is fair, transparent, and provides a meaningful voice to the entities that choose to subject themselves to compliance under this program and to all stakeholders impacted by the program. Thank you. Thank you very much for the comments, Ms. Edmonds. Next, we will hear from Fred Hewitt, Senior Policy Associate at the Northwest Energy Coalition. Mr. Hewitt, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good morning in the West and uh, good afternoon in the East. Uh, Fred Hewitt with the Northwest Energy Coalition. Um, very pleased to be here. The coalition uh, represents about 100 organizations in the four Northwest states in British Columbia. We have environmental, civic, and human uh, service organizations progressive utilities like PGE and businesses. Uh, thanks to the commission for this timely workshop and the coalition strongly supports collaborative work of this type to enhance resource adequacy as a key element for a more reliable, clean, affordable, and equitable electric power system. Uh, this is an important time. The recent major outages and near misses bring home the reality of the importance of our electric power system and the risks that disturbances pose for life, health, and safety, as well as everyday activities. The correct response is neither complacency nor panic. We have the technologies, the engineering, the analytical and operational methods. Now we're focusing on more effective coordination within the Western interconnection and with the commission. Some key elements that we see at the moment, profound changes in the context, our climate and weather, system demand shape, resource mix, and the onset of new load from transportation and building electri electrification, uh, new clean resource asset classes, renewable generation, storage and customer side resources that are complementary and diverse and have a wide variety by type, capacity, scale, and location. The transition from single large fuel dependent resources to more diverse and variable resources with more specialized attributes this makes the system more complex, but also has more degrees of freedom and better ways to optimize across all resources. We're also moving from electromechanical control to power electronics, far faster and more precise, creating, creating new challenges to be sure, but also tremendous new opportunity to optimize the system resource dispatch and stabilize the grid. All of this, of course, has uh, implications for resource adequacy. Uh, we've uh, been. Uh, we also now have new supporting technologies and capabilities, ranging from synchrophasers to advanced weather forecasting, and we also have a new era of system models and other software tools to help assess and shape the choices that support resource adequacy. This panel is focusing on facilitation, inputs, and planning processes to support enhanced resource adequacy, including, among others, uh, more effective strategies for data quality availability, protection, and security, more effective interaction of the industry, regulators, and other stakeholders in resource adequacy assessment and planning time. Uh, and I'd also like to mention uh, congratulations to the Commission. Thanks to Chairman Glick for today's announcement and to Commissioner Clements for your leadership on the formation of the Office of Public Participation. And lastly, uh, we are also looking, obviously, at more effective coordination of system operations markets and reliability coordination in operating time. Thank you, and I look forward to our discussion. Great, thank you, Mr. Hewitt. We will next hear from Peter Griffiths, who is Chief of Comprehensive Procurement Framework at the Pacific Gas and Electric Company in California. Go ahead, Mr. Griffiths. Mr. Griffiths, if you can hear me, you might be on mute. Sorry about that. Um, my name is Peter Griffiths. I am the Chief of a Comprehensive Procurement Framework at PG&E, um, and I've been focused on the role of resource adequacy in capacity markets for the last decade. PG&E plays a lot of different roles in California, including transmission owner, load serving entity, distribution system uh, owner and operator, central procurement entity, gas system owner and operator, hydro licensee and hydro operator, and generation owner. Utilities in the West have always relied on each other to share capacity with power flowing north to south in the summer 
and south to north in the winter. This was relatively easy when there was plenty of capacity and different parts of the West peaked in different seasons. The same generator could be used to meet RA requirements in different regions of the West if those regional peaks did not coincide and there was enough trans transmission capacity available. In the last year or so, this has changed as the peaks have become more coincident and there has been a significant shift from on-demand fossil resources to use-limited renewable resources in all regions of the West. The question facing the West is this, how can the various RA systems be fit together so that the same capacity can meet RA needs in different regions when it is appropriate to do so? As the lone uh, voice from California on this panel, my perspective is this, the RA program at ICAISO is well established and has been evolving for, for the last 15 years. It has added complexity to deal with issues that have come up like ramping capability uh, to meet the, the neck of the duck. The RA structure in California is also deeply integrated to the rest of the market framework and the centralized optimization of energy and transmission on a daily basis, as well as coordinated with the transmission planning through the ISO's, the CAISO's uh, transmission planning process. Entities in CAISO are already benefiting from the full RTO ISO structure and all of the benefits that it brings. Currently, discussions in California are focused on two problems that have arisen recently. First, how to meet demand in all hours, not just peak hours. It should not be lost on anyone that the rolling blackouts that occurred last August did not happen during the peak hours, at a time of day when not all resources counting for RA were able to produce. Second, how do the best integrate the storage uh, into the RA program? From a capacity perspective, Storage can meet demand just like any other fossil fire generator. However, from an energy perspective, storage resources are consumers of energy and do not produce energy. So the question becomes, how does California's well-developed RA program with accompanying optimization of resources and transmission uses by an ISO mesh with the developing RA programs in the rest of the West that rely on bilateral markets with contract path transmission allocation? This is an issue that I think we all need to focus on. Yesterday, we heard participants express a preference for an incremental approach to developing RA in the West as a whole. For a nascent organization and structure where there has only been loose capacity market, uh, and market coordination, an incremental approach may make sense. However, two points should be kept in mind. First, focus should not be lost on the ultimate goal, a full RTO structure with coordinated energy markets and transmission planning. Second, given the market development in California, it's unclear how each incremental step will move, that process, move forward along that process. PG&E is in favor of a West-wide RTO, but the structure of that entity and how we get there matters. We understand that governance is an issue that needs to be addressed. No one wants to be sub subject themselves to a system that can, can dict that can be dictated by others. We also, in California, need to see clear benefits for consumers in California for each of the incremental steps that we take along this path. With that said, I look forward to our further discussions and turn it back over to Naveen. Thank you very much indeed for that. Up next, we will hear from Anders Johnson, who is the Electrical Engineer within Long-Term Planning at the Bonneville Power Administration. Mr. Johnson, please make your remarks. Hello, this is Anders Johnson from Bonneville Power. I'd like to thank the Commission for the opportunity to share observations on this topic. Um, first, the characteristics of the Pacific Northwest electric power system illustrate opportunities for a resource adequacy program, as well as the importance of the transmission system. The large physical footprint contains load and resource diversity. This includes a blend of summer, winter, and dual peaking load areas. Most existing generation capacity comes from large power plants that are outside of major load centers and are delivered over long distance extra high voltage transmission lines. Power flows on the transmission system remain important because new resources continue to be sited far from load centers and at different locations than retiring thermal generators. New resources often have different voltage, inertia, frequency control, and fuel fuel characteristics than the older resources that they are replacing. This will in turn change the performance characteristics of the regional power system. 
It will also impact reliability and increase the complexity faced by operators and planners. It's not always a one-to-one -one relationship. Adverse conditions such as winter cold snaps, summer heat waves, and droughts are concerns for resource adequacy, even if the region continues to have surplus energy at other times of the year. Regions should be encouraged to develop mutually agreeable resource adequacy programs that respect structural considerations of diverse stakeholders. A regional RA program promotes accountability and transparency by providing a look at how the system as a whole will be performing. This includes consistent assumptions about load forecasts, qualifying carrying capacity of generating resources, and the utilization of transmission. It provides an excellent way to improve situational awareness information and make adjustments as needed. The proposed Northwest Power Pool Resource Adequacy Program would complement other processes, including the following. Integrated resource planning, including the associated regulatory oversight and stakeholder participation. Collaborative regional transmission planning, coordinated by Northern Grid and other regional planning organizations. OAT-based processes administered by transmission providers, including studies of transmission service requests and representation of existing contractual rights and statutes, and also real-time markets such as the Western EIM. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Next on the panel, we will hear from Scott Miller, who is the Executive Director of Western Power Trading Forum Mr. Miller, please go ahead. Thank you and uh, good afternoon to uh, the commission and staff and good morning to all my friends in the West. Um, <clears throat> the Western Power Trading Forum is uh, composed of almost 100 members that is uh, uh, competitive generators, utilities, public utilities, CCAs, uh, electric service providers, um, <clears throat> and uh, all, of, all of whom are developing, many of whom are developing uh, renewable re or own renewable resources. So we're arguably one of the more diverse participants in this conversation. <clears throat> and it's in that vein in terms of diversity that I offer the following comments that are primarily directed at the Northwest Power Pool design. First, let me praise the efforts of our friends involved in the Northwest Power Pool resource adequacy design. Uh, given the past failures in the region to construct an agreed upon regional con uh, 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 anything like this in the region, uh, there's a lot to like. I very much appreciate that this is the first serious effort to address RA on a meaningfully broad scale. And I totally approve of the avoidance of an overly administrative arrangement that often accompanies more centralized capacity markets. Um, however, if I were granted the omnipotence and the clairvoyance of a philosopher king, I would insist on certain changes to address specific concerns. These concerns are first, RA feasibility, two, a failure uh, initially to address transmission access, which is key to deliverability, uh, three, transparency of RA pricing, and uh, four, governance. And I understand that that's under discussion, but currently we're dealing with this under a, with a, a group of what is essentially a group of incumbents. Um, first, feasibility of RA arrangements is limited when applied without the benefit of an optimized security constrained economic dispatch. And I know we're not here to talk about RTOs. Um, however, this limits the useful universe of transmission as well as the number of resources that could meet the needs of load of a load serving entity. In the current Western situation, this is not a market issue, but one of reliability as resources, RA resources are tight compared to demand. Thus, any, any limitation on transmission is of concern, and this leads to my second concern, transmission allocation without the benefit of a broad independent entity that dispatches the system is difficult to monitor to assure that it's being done in a non-discriminatory manner. Uh, as is the case with a just-in-time product as electricity is, uh, the state of the system is incredibly ephemeral, changing all the time. A generation unit marginally goes up and the transmission state and congestion changes. A unit goes marginally down or all the way down, even incrementally, the system changes. 
This is why the contract path process of transmission allocation used by most utilities outside of an R RTO is problematic. It limits transmission so as to not get in the way of, of an adjacent system. And the contract path is a neat simplification for contract purposes, but it is a fiction uh, to treat a 230 kV transmission path as if it were a natural gas pipeline with molecules going in one direction. Uh, transparency is currently lacking, and this can undermine confidence of regulators uh, in the resulting pricing. Uh, I'm not an advocate for a centralized capacity market in any way to address the RA needs of the West. Um, I could conceive, however, of a bulletin board or a scoreboard administered by an entity like Northwest Power Pool with an independent board to provide a view into the pricing of discrete geographic or transmission areas of the RA construct. I'm tempted to argue here for an R R RTO, but I know the regional watchword is incrementalism. Governance uh, is not an esoteric issue. Any organization that oversees RA administration for a region must have independent governance. The current Northwest Power Pool process is one that is currently dominated by utilities which mostly own generation and transmission. It's a sincere hope that the current process for determining the conceptual design of the Northwest Power Pool, and I know in these sorts of conversations, limiting the number of voices is, is somewhat helpful. However, ultimately, we hope to provide for an independent board, which will not only provide assurance of all participants' needs, but for those of the states as well. Having raised four issues, what is uh, what might a reasonable uh, uh, solution be? Well, concerns one and two, RA feasibility and transmission allocation, could be addressed by adopting a broad regional security constrained economic dispatch along the lines of many RTO structures. And I know not initially, but as soon as possible after the adoption of the Northwest Power Pool RA construct. The benefit of such an arrangement is that it allows for an independent and real-time overview of the system that maximizes transmission to a greater extent than the contract path arrangements between balancing authorities. Concern three, price transparency, would easily be achieved by a broad geographic security constraint economic dispatch. However, until that is a, real, a reality, reporting RA to an agreed upon regulator or a set of regulators by an independent board that reflects prices could be a useful interim solution. Concern four regarding governance can address many of the other aspects, the other concerns, except for feasibility. And therefore, go, um, governance is key. Um, and I know many people have addressed this, but it deserves reiteration. The independence of governance has been a cornerstone for FERC for, ex for exceptionally good reasons. Only providing for assurances that the system and its design are there to benefit all who seek to serve customers will RA be maximized and economically allocated. Finding a way to accommodate the interests of states in the region regarding RA governance along the lines that Oregon Commissioner Letha Tawney will doubtless discuss in the next panel is crucial. I mentioned a final but perhaps inconvenient point. California, as Peter Griffiths pointed out, is key, a key component that is missing from the discussion. Its regulatory decisions can create an artificial barrier separating the largest single market from the rest of the region. Additionally, its current structure is an extremely complicated arrangement between the California Energy Commission, the California Public Utilities Commission, and the California ISO. I hope the commissioners will ask Mr. Ed Randolph of the CPUC, who will appear on panel four, what, if any consideration, has been given to an RA structure in California that can be included eventually in the Western RA constructs. Given the integral role that California and the rest of the West play in each other's electric needs, this is important. It would be optimal if there were a westwide RTO, as was demonstrated in the recent state-led study of market structures in the West that was financed by DOE. However, the CAISO governance is an obvious hindrance to CAISO taking this role. The California uh, political dynamic makes this unlikely to change. While, there are, while we are not here to discuss RTOs or similar market structures, I hope everyone appreciates how many legitimate concerns the incremental approach of the Northwest Power Pool RA structure could be solved by the movement towards an RA RTO quickly 
after the establishment of the RA function. Given the experience of many of the Northwest Power Pool participants in the EIM, I have a novel suggestion which allows, would allow for a fast move from an RA construct to full functionality that would enhance RA. First, the CAISO establishes a limited liability corporation to perform the market administration outside of California. In other words, they get approval from their board to form an LLC to offer market administrative services. Two, the Northwest Power Pool entities and other stakeholders then negotiate the terms for contracting with the CAISO LLC to perform these services for them. The result would be two RTOs, but they would obviously closely coordinate. Making these points is not intended to be an impediment to successful implementation of the Northwest Power Pool RA construct, but rather to create an institution that is more durable and adds to the reliability of the region and the transition of the, of the industry that everyone is seeking. Thanks. Thank you very much for those thoughtful comments, Mr. Miller. We will next hear from Commissioner Christine Raper of the Idaho Public Utilities Commission and also Chair of the Western Interconnection Regional Advisory Body. Commissioner, please go ahead. Good morning. Well, good afternoon, Chairman and Commissioners, and good morning to my colleagues in the West. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with this esteemed group of individuals. My name is Christine Raper. While I serve as a commissioner at the Idaho Public Utilities Commission, I'm here today in my capacity as the chair of the Western Interconnection Regional Advisory Body, and I'll be speaking on behalf of YRAB. If you walk away with only one message from my participation today, I would want it to be this. The RA problem in the West is not primarily a planning problem. It is also not primarily a technology problem. The resource adequacy problem in the West is primarily a regional capacity sharing and information sharing problem. Electric utilities in the West have historically relied on the bilateral wholesale electricity market to exchange capacity and energy to meet resource adequacy requirements. Utility executives and regulators have long recognized regional sharing of capacity and energy as a part of a low cost resource strategy for utility customers. In the past, this exchange of capacity and energy between electric utilities was uncomplicated and did not warrant constant scrutiny on the part of regulators or policymakers because the West enjoyed a large surplus of generating capacity. Today, the resource strategy remains largely the same, but its implementation is complicated because the regional surplus is gone. The West continues to enjoy great resource diversity across the geographic footprint. Market transactions can still be a low cost solution to meeting capacity requirements and can also be a low risk solution to avoiding stranded investments. So what is the problem? The problem is that utility executives and regulators are leery of counting on the wholesale market because we lack good information about the capacity position of our neighbors. We cannot rely on market imports because we do not know if the counterparties are good for it. When supply and demand conditions are tight across the entire Western footprint, how can you count on imports? The situation is somewhat like deciding whether to attend an in-person meeting during a pandemic. Can you trust that all attendees are fully vaccinated? The lack of information about your neighbors becomes the issue, and it's making people nervous without additional assurances. Instead of assumption-driven resource adequacy, regulators are now demanding that RA decisions be data-driven. The problem in the West is that we do not have a regional organization or clearinghouse that collects transactional load and resource information from individual electric utilities and distributes that information on the size of the regional surplus or deficit to utility executives, regulators, policymakers, and the public. Institutions and practices that we relied on in the past will not work in the future. If the West is going to continue to enjoy the diversity benefits of exchanging capacity and energy across its entire geographic footprint, we need to improve our information sharing. The immediate and enduring solution to the resource adequacy problem in the West is a regional organization that serves as an information clearinghouse. 
a regional program can capture the benefits of diversity in supply and demand that still exist. The Northwest Power Pool is actually working to develop such a program that could include a significant number of load serving entities in the West. Its proposed forward showing program would function as a clearinghouse that collects transactional load and resource information from individual electric utilities and distributes information on the size of the regional surplus or deficit to utilities, policymakers, regulators, and the public. The program would collect confidential and market sensitive information from individual electric utilities and the power pool would need to protect that information. However, to be a successful information clearinghouse, the power pool must also disseminate some of that information and data to support its regional findings. Policymakers and regulators will no longer just accept assertions of adequacy without evidence. Many will likely take a trust but verify approach to the pronouncements of a regional program administrator and states like my own commission would have to be willing to give up some of the control. But that is precisely the reason why the governance structure of a new regional organization is going to be paramount. The organization must be independent, transparent, and respect the authority of utility executives and state and provincial regulators and policymakers to determine the future resource adequacy needs and appropriate resource mix of the electric utilities in the West. The resource adequacy problem in the West is not insurmountable, but it will take trust and sharing and collaboration. And so everyone has to be willing to play well in the Western Interconnection Sandbox. And I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for those points, Commissioner. We will now come to our final panelist for panel three, who is Steve Wright, General Manager of the Chelan Public Utility District in Washington State. Mr. Wright, please go ahead. Thank you. Chairman Glick, commissioners and staff, thank you for establishing this conference on an issue of utmost importance. Chelan is a Washington consumer-owned utility operating three hydroelectric facilities with more than 2,000 megawatts of capacity. We serve our own loads while also selling a substantial amount of output, mostly long-term, helping other entities meet their goals for achieving clean, reliable, and affordable electricity. I submitted written testimony. I want to use my time today to address the Commission's question about how it can help. Over the last three years, the Northwest electricity interests have aligned that the most significant issue confronting consumers is the need to assure resource adequacy. This is the result of two key factors, a variety of disturbing forecasts of loads, resources, and resulting reliability. It looks like we're exposed to both capacity type outages experienced in California and the energy type outages experienced in Texas. Second, a distant but still very vivid memory of the impacts of the West Coast energy crisis on consumers and the environment. The use of the term reliability can be a bit antiseptic, understating the impact on the public we are all committed to serve. The 2001 energy crisis, which was fundamentally a resource adequacy issue, resulted in extraordinary costs and rate increases. Tens of thousands of jobs lost and failed businesses leading to devastating impacts for families, schools, and local governments. Environmental protection was compromised. As the leader of the Bonneville Power Administration during that time, I wish I could describe how devastating it was to sit in front of citizens whose lives were completely upended through no fault of their own, who could not understand why we, industry leaders, had allowed that to happen. I've recently shared memories of that scarring six-month crisis trying to convey the magnitude of the impacts. This could be shared with the commissioners if you are interested. To put this in perspective, winter storm URI lasted a week. The West Coast energy crisis with wholesale market prices that were on par with URI lasted six months. Our efforts now seek to avoid repeating history. A few years later, while the impacts of the crisis were still fresh, the commission sought to impose a market design on the nation that was not responsive to the causes of the energy crisis or reflective of the unique needs of the storage rich hydro-dominated Northwest, and I want to underscore that hydro makes the operation of the Northwest system unique. With people still reeling from the energy crisis, the proposal came across as adding salt to the wound. The proposal and the response has impacted the relationship between FERC and the Northwest ever since. Today, the Northwest is taking actions to reduce carbon emissions, responding to some of the most aggressive state policies in the country. 
Resource adequacy has become the cornerstone Northwest issue to making a clean electricity transition while protecting affordability and reliability. It is noteworthy that the Northwest Power Pool effort is a bottoms up approach, representing a commitment of some of the best talent in the region from entities across the electricity interest spectrum. Many of us are making compromises to long held positions regarding FERC jurisdiction, independent governance, and potentially exposing our customers to financial penalties because of a belief in the criticality of resource adequacy. We are getting past that relationship history from 20 years ago. There is more momentum and alignment around this initiative than any regional process since the Northwest Power Act in the 1970s and the Northwest Hydro System Coordination Agreements that were signed in the 1960s. Since the standard market design proposal, the FERC has generally taken a be helpful but do not direct approach to the Northwest on regional market issues. That has included providing very valuable technical support and liaison. FERC has made available its brilliant people at all levels of the organization who have visibility across various markets around the country providing useful advice and counsel. I would urge you to continue this approach. We recognize the Commission has authority to ultimately approve or reject new market structures that are likely necessary to make resource adequacy standards effective. We would ask that you give us leeway to design Northwest solutions. Rest assured, we are closely examining Commission precedent and listening to your advice. Recently, there have been some voices encouraging the Commission to utilize latent Federal Power Act authority to direct activities in regions without RTOs. I would ask that you not heed these voices. We are working hard on what matters most to Northwest consumers. An intrusion into this process by the Commission to redirect activities would be a major blow to a process that has an increasingly real chance of success. I also want to take a moment to add my thoughts to a couple of questions raised yesterday. I agree with comments made by many on the second panel about supporting incremental approaches. I would add our current approach is not about siloing, but about setting priorities. We can see the potential value of transmission planning, operational enhancements, and more formal market structures. Our efforts have vision about setting the table now on issues such as governance, so those elements can be incorporated in the future. But we need to go after what is most important, bite off what we can chew, and produce a regional success. Second, I too have serious reservations about mandatory capacity markets. Capacity is not an easily commoditized product. As a significant seller of capacity, Chelan has found the bilateral market attractive because we can best match our product and our risk appetite with willing buyers. For example, we share stream flow risk with our purchasers, something that would be tough to do in a capacity market. Moreover, we have not seen capacity markets in other regions enjoying substantial support, particularly from our public power brethren. Thank you for the time to be with you today and the opportunity to, to share some thoughts. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for those comments, Mr. Now that we've reached the last panelist, we will now begin the question and answer segment of this panel. As a reminder on logistics, if a question is directed at a specific panelist, please unmute yourself and respond, and mute yourself again after you have done responding. If a panelist would like to answer a general question directed at the panel or make any supplemental remarks, we encourage you to use the WebEx raise hand function to indicate to us that you'd like to speak. Alternatively, if you are on a phone call or if something is arrived with the raise hand function, please turn on your microphone and let us know you'd like to make a comment. Based on the indications, we will sequentially call upon speakers who indicated that they'd like to respond. Um, I will now hand it over to Chairman Glick for the question and answer session. Ms. Chairman Glick, um, up to you. Thank you very much, Naveen. And, and I want to start off by thanking all the panelists today for your uh, important uh, contributions. I, I, you know, it's, uh, I know you all have very busy schedules and your ability to take time out to have this discussion is very, very helpful for us. So thank you. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, secondly, I wanted to start with a, a you know, relevant uh, a kind of a breaking news subject in a way. I mentioned yesterday, I saw a forecast that it was supposed to be like 110 degrees in Portland on Sunday. I saw a forecast, an updated forecast this morning that was supposed to be 113. And I looked at Seattle, it's supposed to be 100. Um, and I know other parts of the Northwest and uh, are supposed to be extremely hot. Spokane, for instance, I'm sure parts of Idaho. Uh, and elsewhere. So I'm wondering, uh, maybe uh, Ms. Edmonds, Mr. Wright, and uh, Commissioner Draper and, and Commissioner Cordova, um, I'm wondering if uh, you have any updates and how you think, how you, uh, uh, if you see any uh, serious concerns coming up over the next couple of days. 
Thank you, Chair Glick. Um, I'll go ahead and wait in here. Yeah, I, I was going to make a comment in my opening remarks that we're heading into a weekend here in Oregon that's forecasted to be a June heat wave, a June heat wave in Oregon. And it leads to comments like this is unprecedented. And I feel like after the last 12 months, that word just needs to be taken out of the lexicon. So what is this new normal? Yes, uh, the, the Portland general system has been seeing highs much earlier in the summer. Um, it's not so much the weekend itself, but when loads come back on on Monday, uh, when business resumes, we're keeping a very careful watch on this. Um, I think you heard from a lot of commenters yesterday, and, and PGE is no exception, that we're operating in a very conservative mode headed into weekend and for Monday. We're also taking full advantage of all the flexibility on our system that we have. Portland General Electric, for example, has a 65 megawatt demand resource response program that's proven very helpful and effective for getting through these periods. But it certainly does um, point to the constraints that climate change is putting on the system. It raises all the questions that you raised yesterday, Chair Glick, about what is the correct planning standard is one in 10 needing to move to a one in 20, a one in 50. I think what I would say about the, the approach of the Northwest Power Pool is we have a principle of evolution. Today, we don't have a regional viewpoint on planning needs for the Northwest Power Pool footprint, which is essentially a west-wide footprint. We want to get there, and then we want to continue to evolve and continuously improve the program and address what we're seeing as what looks like a new normal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Edmonds. Um, Commissioner Cordova, please go ahead next. Thank you. Um, I won't repeat some of the stuff that Ms. Edmonds just shared, but um, the one thing we found interesting, because Nevada does get very hot all the time, but it's getting hotter sooner. And the other thing that's kind of interesting is it's getting hot hotter over a wider portion of the West all at the same time. I mean, certainly the temperatures that you mentioned, Chairman Glick, in the regions that you mentioned are very unusual. Um, and so that's something regionally when we look at the sharing of resources that becomes challenging because we're seeing these, uh, these kind of heat events occur over a wider region. Um, they're occurring sooner. Some of the discussions we're ha having here at the Nevada Commission about planning are that, you know, we no longer really can plan for peak. We need to kind of plan for much larger, longer periods of time because the weather is just really hotter and more unpredictable. Um, so thank you for the question. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Hewitt, please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, so I'm here in Portland uh, and very concerned about the weather event we're about to have. Uh, this past Monday, we had a very hot day. It was 97 here. And uh, we saw flows on the DC intertie, one of our big uh, West Coast intertie uh, projects, uh, going from south to north, coming up to the northwest during that very hot weather. Uh, I'm sure Steve Wright, when he was BPA administrator, would agree this is a really unprecedented thing to see during the hydro runoff period that we have. But it highlights the importance of using our entire Western grid in a more effective way. Uh, Brian Silverstein, who used to work for Steve Wright as a vice president of transmission and went on to become chair of the Peak Reliability Board, used to say, we're one big grid. We have long lines, we have loop flow, we have uh, characteristics of our system that make us somewhat different than the East and really highlight the importance of regional coordination to address resource adequacy. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Hewitt. Chairman, back to you. Mute. Sorry about that. Mr. Wright, do you want to comment? I saw your hand. Yeah, thank you. I knew uh, the raise hand very well there, did I? Um, so just a couple of quick comments. Uh, it, this will be a very challenging week for sure. It's a, a week of extraordinarily high temperatures uh, relative to normal. Uh, but a few things to keep in mind. Um, number one, we are still a winter peaking system. And uh, so the loads are not as high now as they would be if it was the winter peak. Uh, and fortunately, actually, we're still in snowmelt season. And so high temperatures actually leads to more snowmelt, leads to more river flows. Uh, 
my own guess is that uh, we will make it through this unless the high temperatures do damage to mechanical systems don't do well in high temperatures and so if we were to lose something big then we've got a really serious problem but i think if we make it through this it shouldn't be assumed that uh, well then we don't have problems um, we have an increasingly brittle system and uh, this will be just one more step along the way to a more brittle system uh, and uh, we'll we'll see impacts in terms of prices. We can already see them right now in terms of what's happening over the course of the balance of month prices that are out there. Uh, so what we're really getting are uh, continuing early warning signals of problems that we need to address. Thank you. I appreciate the responses there. Obviously, we'll keep an eye on what's coming up this week. Um, I wanted to switch over to a, kind of a broader discussion. So folks yesterday and, and again today mentioned there, there are some, you know, needs, there are some needs out there in terms of resource adequacy in the West in terms of uh, uh, maybe more coordination on metrics, on um, approaches, on um, measurements, and, and, and obviously on, on uh, solutions or at least uh, uh, approaches to, to, address, to, to address resource adequacy concerns. And uh, I know, uh, Mr. Miller, you mentioned incrementalism, and uh, several other people did too, did Mr. Wright. And, and I, I, again, I'm, I'm well aware of the, the history of what's gone on with regard to the California, the Western energy crisis and what that means um, uh, for the discussions that have gone on in the region and still, you know, 20 years later, it's still there's a big shadow hanging over the region. Um, but I'm wondering if, you know, in, in this discussion of incrementalism, and again, I want to make the point that the Northwest um, Northwest, Northwest Power Pool uh, discussions, and, and yeah, I don't want to prejudge the matter because it's come before the commission, but obviously it's a step in the, it may be a step in the right direction. Um, but I'm wondering if we if we need to uh, turn away from incrementalism. Now, I know we've, from a FERC perspective, and, and I still think that these decisions need to be made at the regional level and need to be, you know, need to come organically. But given the challenges that we're facing that's been laid out over the last couple of days that people know about, uh, not only in California, but the rest of the region. Um, do we need to be a little bolder? Do we need to move forward? Does the region need to move forward on the discussions on developing an RTO or maybe more than one RTO um, more quickly than, than has been the case today? So I just lay, lay, lay that out there for everybody to, to respond to. Thank you, Chairman. Um, first, we have uh, Scott Miller. Mr. Miller, please go ahead. Thanks for the uh, observation, uh, Chairman Glick. Um, as, as somebody uh, who's very, very uh, acquainted with the restraint that FERC has exercised, and I know will continue to exercise um, since the uh, power crisis, um, I, I, that's one of the reasons why I've suggested that I, I hear the need to take one step at a time um, and I've had conversations with my friends in the West, particularly Ms. Edmonds, um, and I have had that conversation on many of occasions. And I've expressed the sense of urgency. I, I feel, however, sometimes when I hear some people say incrementalism, it sounds like, okay, we've got a fire. Let me choose which garden hose I should uh, connect to the faucet. Um, and um, uh, that's why the, 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 the West has made many changes um and eim was a tremendous thing to do what the northwest power pool is doing now but that's why i think that there is a way to move quickly once the northwest power pool uh ra structure is established and i know commissioner tawny from oregon has emphasized let's get this done and then we can talk about an rto um and that's why i suggested because it, we can't wait for the California political situation to change. We're going to have to probably have to have more than one RTO. Um, let's just try and do it in a way where the seams are limited. Um, and there's a way to do that pretty quickly after you do, uh, after you finish the Northwest Power Pool. Um, because an RTO does bring together how you utilize the RA that you're now counting better to the greatest extent, and it informs the transmission planning process at the same time. Um, that, that I think you're absolutely right. We need to move as quickly as possible. Thank you very much, Mr. Miller. Ms. Edmond, go ahead. Thank you. Great question. 
So I would I would observe Chair Glick that incrementalism is also evolution. It leads somewhere. And I think that's the road that we're on. It is a building block. The way that we have approached the program in Northwest Power Pool, all of the utilities and other companies that are part of that effort is let's not wait around for a day ahead real time market solution. We can't wait. We need to act now. And I would certainly observe that resource adequacy can be that fundamental foundation, that solid basement to put additional market grid optimization on top. And we have made a concerted effort in the design of the regional RA program to ensure that when that market optimization solution becomes more clear, whether that's the California ISO or another market operator partner, we would be ready to plug into such a program and inform day ahead and real time with solid resource adequacy foundational inputs. The other thing I want to say, I do agree with Mr. Miller that time is of the essence. We can't take a lot of time to put these building blocks together, but it is about building trust and trust is a real issue in the West. You've heard several speakers today and yesterday bring that up, but I also would submit a challenge to Mr. Miller and to, to anyone in the region. I don't, I don't want to hear that a full governance solution in California is unlikely to happen. I, I challenge California, I challenge the region, even though there were prior attempts, those were years ago, the partners were different. The region has evolved substantially since 2015. So have the constraints on our system. So I never want to give up on that solution because I do think California ISO and the utilities there have been excellent partners to us. That being said, we do need to look at all of the grid coordination and optimization tools that we need to meet our goals. And I fully agree, that's not just RA, it's all of those pieces put together. Thank you very much, Ms. Edmonds. Commissioner Cordova, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I could talk all day about why I think um, the region is behaving the way it is currently, but I was here 20 years ago when we had the Western energy crisis. And I will tell you from the Nevada perspective, our response to the concerns about adequate resources at that time was an isolation response. We embarked on a huge generation construction regime in Nevada. Other states behaved similarly. Um, our response now is that we are reaching out to our neighbors. We are doubling down, as I said, on regionalization. Um, and I'm seeing that across the West. So to your question of, you know, how do we move forward on this? Well, I do think that there is differences that I'm seeing currently in the behavior and the engagement of my neighbors. And I think that that matters. I think that that's important in trying to determine, you know, where does FERC need to take leadership in this matter? Because frankly, even just this technical conference that we're having, from my perspective, is a real demonstration of FERC's leadership. Allowing the Western entities to get together and have these discussions is fruitful. Um, the fact that there is real action that's occurring in various entities in the West, we heard some of that yesterday and, and more of it today, um, demonstrates, I think, that entities in the West are taking this seriously and are moving in a direction. My biggest fear would be that, um, you know, when you have leadership that comes in and it tells people what to do, as opposed to try to create a culture of working together, sometimes it causes people to become stubborn and disengage. Um, and so, you know, at the Nevada Commission, we're a small commission. Um, for us to engage with our neighbors on top of all of the activities we currently are engaged in, it, it's a big ask and it takes longer than I think any of us would like to, but, um, but I'm certainly seeing a very different response to some of the adequacy, resource adequacy concerns now than I saw 20 years ago. Thank you for those comments, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Griffiths, please go ahead, you're next. Uh, yes, I mean, that's a really good question in terms of how quickly does this whole process need to move to be able to be effective. And I think um, for the most part, from a California perspective, um, you know, there there are issues uh, in terms of where we're going and how we're getting there and what are, what are the next steps. Uh, we do have the problem of sort of integrating this um, well-defined California RA structure into something that works on a, on a, on a, on a west-wide basis or a better, better basis. And that's not an insignificant issue. Um, you know, I would like to say that it might be possible to have the California 
approach be adopted elsewhere. Uh, but I know better. I know that California has uh, it, it right now has an RA program that is the evolution that has a lot of has made some mistakes that hasn't corrected those mistakes yet. I'm not sure that I would want to bring those on the rest of the West uh, to some degree. And so I think it's it's very much a, uh, a, a an opportunity uh, for for there to be discussions and for ways to work that out. Now, that said, there will still have to be the question of how do we make these RA structures that are very different or could be very different work as the evolution takes place. Thank you, Mr. Griffiths. Uh, Ms. Beck, you're next. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I'm of two minds on this issue, if I'm honest. Um, 20 years ago during the crisis, I wasn't here in the West. Um, I spent the first half of my career in the Midwest, in the upper Midwest. And so at that time, and we had our own mini crisis then, but at that time I was in a, a large GNT working on um, integrating uh, our system into the Midwest ISO and then watching the Midwest ISO market go live. And so I would question if, if saying, if there's a if there really is an alternative that is not incremental um because i think even if if ever if all the barriers dissolved and we wanted to move to an rto that would still take a while to set up and it would probably happen incrementally um on the other hand i will say that um coming from a you know very small um office and um speaking for all of the consumer reps in the west we are always terribly under-resourced and it's hard to, ma to to monitor and follow all these multiple processes um so you know sometimes i wonder well would that be better um of course we'd have to be invited to the table that's you know another story um but uh anyway that's the reason i i'm a little bit of two minds on this thank you very much Ms. beck mr hewitt you're next please go ahead Thank you. Uh, so Northwest Energy Coalition strongly supports uh, a result that is a full single RTO in the West. Uh, just to start with that point, um, the state-led market options study sponsored by the Utah Office of Energy Development and with uh, very strong participation by all the states in the West through the Western Interstate Energy Board, uh, just has re uh, that study has uh, uh, been now, uh, we now have the draft results just this week. And it shows a very uh, significant uh, advantage, net benefits to every state that are larger with a single Western RTO than with any two market approach or with something lesser. Uh, but I also have to say, previous efforts in the West to go to the full RTO have fallen short. The centrifugal forces of different political uh, perspectives in the state and really of the technical issues underlying the complexity of moving to a full market have really pulled us uh, have pulled us uh, short of that mark. So I think our our proposal, uh, and and by the way, in that regard, I would say we need an RTO design in the West that's suitable to the future grid that we have, that we're going to have, as opposed to the grid we have had in the past. Although many of those elements will still be there for the reasons I mentioned in the beginning, uh, in my beginning comments. But the, I think our view is that we need kind of a, an accelerated incrementalism here in order to achieve success. That building trust, as was mentioned, is really important. Getting operational uh, uh, features in place. The building blocks approach makes a lot of uh, sense to us, but certainly a heightened sense of urgency in doing that is really important right now. Thanks. Thank you very much. Mr. Wright, please go ahead. So you probably have a sense of where I'm coming from from my opening comments, but I'll uh, just add a couple things. One, I completely endorse Sarah Admin's comments. I think she nailed it in terms of uh, how, how we're thinking about this. It's not a rejection of where of these other things that are needed. It's really an, a, a sense of prioritization. What do we need to do first in order to be able to be successful? Mr. Johnson spoke to the fact that we are looking at transmission planning and how to engage transmission planning in this effort. Uh, so there, a lot of those things are happening, but I just want to underscore this, the, the relationship issue. Uh, we tried in the past to make these things work and we've struggled with it. Um, we need to have a success, honestly, and we are on a path to a success right now. We're 
There are some really strong relationships being built. Honestly, relationships are being rebuilt between folks in the region and the FERC right now, because um, we're stepping forward and suggesting there would be more FERC jurisdiction in this uh, in this proposal that we're making. Um, we need to really succeed at this. And when we succeed at this, it's going to create the pathway to be able to do many of the other things that um, I think many of us believe are going to be necessary. But we see a, a, uh, the way to get there is one step at a time. Thank you very much, Mr. Wright. Commissioner Raper, you're next. Please go ahead. Thank you. And thank you, Chair Glick, for the question. And I would just say I can appreciate from somewhere not in the Western interconnection, when, you, when you're not sitting in the Western interconnection, how it doesn't look like we're moving very quickly here. Um, I agree with all the comments about evolution also, but I would add that when you're in the Western interconnection, this feels like warp speed right now. I mean, we're moving on all fronts, right? The EIM has a governance review committee that's looking at a joint authority model that gives the EIM governing body some balance of authority between the CAISO board and SPP has their energy imbalance system now that, that is um, up and running and, and has quite a few participants and the Northwest Power Pool is moving in its direction for RA and so I would just um, I guess uh, temper the reaction of of maybe from the outside looking in that it that it doesn't look like we're doing enough quickly enough, but from the inside of the Western interconnection as a commissioner in Idaho that tries desperately to participate in the discussions across the board so that I don't miss anything. I can't, I don't have enough hours in a day to make all of the meetings on all of the subject matter that is important for this issue to be covered well and to move it forward in a in a thoughtful and correct way and so um so i would just say i i really feel like we are moving at a pretty fast pace here to get things in place because we inside the interconnection do recognize that these are issues that have to be addressed and they have to be addressed yesterday so uh just reassurance that we are moving very quickly thank you for that commissioner uh, chairman back to you Thanks, Davina. I, I, I want to thank everyone for those, those very thoughtful comments, and uh, it's, it's, it's helpful to form our views, I think, here at, at FERC. I um, want to uh, make sure there's enough time for my colleagues to ask their questions, so I'll move on and ask Mr. Danley if he's got any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any specific questions, but I've really appreciated the engagement. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Danley. Commissioner Clements? Thank you, Chairman. This has been a really informative conversation. I appreciate um, the, the perspectives and I'm processing in real time. So my question isn't fully baked, but um, there's somehow this mention of a capacity market got into the conversation. It feels like that's never been on the table in the West. And we all know that resource adequacy is squarely within the uh, authority of the states uh, as a starting point. And, and, and um, I think that remains the, the focus in thinking through the, this RA process. Um, is there any concern on the on the resource adequacy regional effort about getting the states to approve common metrics or approaches um, that would be the linchpin of making this work? That's part one of the question. And then part two is, uh, starting with Ms. Edmonds, but others are welcome to weigh in, encouraged, are, um, can you say a little bit more about the aspects of the RA program that will either interact with or serve as building blocks for that next layer for that the next steps on a, a regional market development that may come after that? I'm going to jump in again. Thank you, Commissioner Clements, for directing that to me. I'll give it a shot here. So there's a lot packed in your question. Let me briefly address both parts. The interaction of a multi-state footprint that does have primary jurisdiction over resource choice, resource procurement, what does that portfolio look like for meeting customer needs is with the states. And we have many states in this footprint. But we also have an overlay of hopefully a successful regional RA program that sets a common planning reserve margin, allocates that margin out 
making other entities that are participants be responsible for their piece of it using common counting rules for resources. In that sentence, I have implicated a lot of similar work that happens locally with state regulators integrated resource plan. So is there a relationship? Absolutely. I would certainly direct attention to the very excellent paper Lawrence National Berkeley Labs and we put out that explores this area of these potential areas of overlay. So the approach here is outreach with states, educating everybody about what the what the program consists of, where these overlay areas are, and then striving for harmony, striving for harmonious outcomes where we can do both. We can engage with our states on resource choice and portfolio, but we can also get the benefits of a regional program that we can't get when we plant resources individually in silos. So that's the first part of it. We are planning this regional RA program as a bilateral program where we can share our capacity through bilateral negotiations with physically backed resources. That is not our ideal economic outcome. The hope is someday, hopefully very soon, there's a day ahead real time market optimization engine that we can attach those resource adequacy inputs to, to dispatch and find the most economic results for sharing in that RA capacity. But as I said in my earlier comments, it didn't make sense for us to wait around for that. We believe through using trading platforms that we already have, potentially with some innovations, we can achieve our objectives while we also work on market solutions for the West as a footprint. Thank you, Ms. Ed. Uh, Ms. Beck, please go ahead. So thank you. Um, I uh, and I think those are some great questions, uh, especially um, I, I really can't speak to the second one, but the one about the about this about the states. And here I'm going to I'm going to make my point one more time and then I'm going to get off my soapbox and I won't say it uh, again unless someone specifically asks me. But I think there um, is some concern about getting all the states on, on, on board because those of us who are stakeholders in that state um, have our process and have our ways of inputting and um, and that's not the case and so I'm just going to say this one time the Northwest Power Pool Resource Adequacy um, Stakeholder Committee is a by invitation only committee and it includes no state agency consumer advocates and so I, I there's so many things that I'm interested in about this and it, it feels very um, it, um, exciting and I'm cautiously optimistic about it um, but every time I hear about the robust stakeholder and how many places they're talking to and how many people and how everyone has been involved um, let me just say that's not building trust um, because I know that we're a segment that's not involved and yet we have great involvement in the processes at our state and um, and to some extent the Utah regulatory process uh, um, operates a little differently. And so I feel like there's some some work to be done, some improvements to be made to, to bridge those gaps. And I don't want to say that this can't work. There's a lot of reason for optimism, but I think there's work to be done to win over both the states and the stakeholders that will be informing those state decisions. Thank you, Ms. Beck. Mr. Griffiths, please go ahead with your comments. Um, yeah, I'm going to say there there are there is a lot of work to do, uh, and getting to states states to agree, I think, is a is a fairly big challenge. Um, and you know, I uh, more as a you know, we are working in the process, but not certainly as deeply in the process, largely because of the fact that of the way the California structure is set up. Um, one thing I I think that can be uh, can be done, and that FERC may be able to do. Um, you know, we have been an advocate for there to be more agreements between balancing areas in in the West um, about having agreements amongst themselves about when things get tight. Um, where do you know where does the limited well, limited energy go, and who has the rights to the limited the limited energy? So in the East, we'll you know I'll note that there are agreements between balancing areas that basically say. You know, you know, I'm going to be able to send this power, but I'm going to be able to recall it under certain circumstances. 
Uh, and you know what are those circumstances and how are they set up? And we don't have those uh, agreements in California or in the West. And it, it, I think to some degree the process would would be uh, would be helped by having some of those agreements and having something uh, some some knowledge uh, to get rid of some of the uncertainty about where the where the scarce power is going to be going uh, when things get tight across the region. Um, I'll pardon, note, you know, pardon the interruption. Sorry, yeah. um, this is this is Colin Beckman from the Office of General Counsel. Um, it appears that we are approaching some specific details of open contested proceedings. Okay. So I will I will just, I will stop then. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Colin. Um, Mr. Wright, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Clements, for the question. And I think it's really interesting that it's juxtaposed against uh, the question that uh, Chairman Glick uh, asked. You can see the challenge of trying to move forward and move forward quickly. Um, we have lots of stakeholders uh, in the West. I know that the people who are doing Northwest Power Pool RA every day are spending tons of time trying to make sure that they are reaching out to as many people as they can. They're running as fast as they can, and even and and yet we know we need to do better, and still trying to reach out and, and connect more people. Uh, and that's part of that building relationships and building trust that's going to be necessary in order to be able to to be successful with this effort. And I'm going to add one more that's going to be a bit challenging for us too, which is. We have a large component of public power in the West, much more than in the East. Uh, Washington State, two thirds of the state is served by public power. For us, uh, the, the mantra is local control. And yet what we're doing here is ceding local control in order to, for the, the better good, um, for the community good, essentially. And we've got a lot of folks that we've got to bring along uh, to make sure that there is a, a good understanding of why it is we're gonna go against something that is a long held belief. Uh, um, I believe we can get there. I believe that that greater good is so important that we are going to find a way to be able to get there. But uh, your question really points out some of the challenges of, of, of trying to build that trust and build those relationships in order to make sure that we can be successful. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Commissioner Raper, please go ahead next. Thank you, Commissioner Clements, for the question. And I want to focus directly on your state commission portion of the question and, and how we might look at this. And without prejudging a document that will likely come before me for multiple utilities, I would say that I will be looking for in any docket what the governance structure of that organization is going to be. And so um, I believe that state commissioners uh, we'll be looking to the same thing. The, the ability with which we can participate in the program once it's up and running is of the utmost importance. And I think it actually goes to Ms. Beck's concerns as well. I think as this all comes to fruition and comes on board, it will be something where, um, where consumer advocates have a role and public power has a seat. And I, I know that some of the speakers earlier in this dialogue have mentioned that the EIM, and I mentioned that the EIM governing body structure and kind of how the nominating committee and everything within that works, it's a good framework that we can at least look to to see what has worked in the recent past, what stakeholders, including state commissioners, have been comfortable with. Um, maybe not entirely, but as Mr. Wright, I think, just said, um, it's it's we have to give a little to get a little, and the state commissioners understand that as well. So I hope that goes directly to your question about what state commissioners might be looking for. It's very helpful. Thank you, Commissioner Raper. Uh, Mr. Wright, I see your hand up. Please go ahead. I'm sorry, if that was for me, it was just I had forgotten to lower my hand. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Hewitt, you're next. Go ahead, please. Thank you. A couple of quick points. First, noting that uh, under the Federal Power Act, states have the primary authority for resource adequacy. So naturally, there will be concerns if the, the locus for that is shifting. But I think, as uh, Commissioner Raper just indicated, there is an interest in the states in that. I will note, it, note that in Oregon, we have a, a state Oregon PUC docket. Uh, this may be something to ask. Commissioner Tawney about in the next panel um, on our on resource adequacy 
uh, actually, I think it was uh, instituted uh, with some input from uh, PGE. And the purpose of the docket, in effect, is going to be to look at the Northwest Power Pool RA program, you know, consider the shape of that and, you know, the characteristics. And if it should falter, uh, you know, what could Oregon do uh, to move uh, forward on resource adequacy? So I think there's a real appetite for really uh, directly addressing those questions. Secondly, we have in the, in the region some important institutions, including the Western Interstate Energy Board and YRAB, and the Western Electricity Coordinating Council, which are focused on common approaches. And for example, at WEC, there's a great deal of work going on to collect data, you know, to, you know, to standardize that, uh, to do model validation and so forth to support resource adequacy assessment. So at that level, the technical level, we already have institutions in place that will help uh, accelerate this process. And finally, on the question of the Northwest Power Pool RA program, you know, one of the questions that we have at the Northwest Energy Coalition is, where does it go from there? It's a building block, but how does it connect to others? And that's an issue we have some concern about, but I think it's an open question, and we are most interested in making sure that that effort succeeds so that we can then have the discussion about where we go from here. Thank you, Mr. Hewitt. Ms. Edmonds, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wright, just want to thank you for adding your comments about how hard we've been working and the outreach we've been doing. It is a major cultural shift for a Northwest Power Pool culture and organization that has been historically delivering very solid and valuable programs, but primarily member and utility driven. In this instance, for the RA effort, our outreach has been broad. Our invites to the Stakeholder Advisory Committee have been broad. We, we do have a consumer advocate on the stakeholder advisory. Um, sometimes we've made outreach and we don't always get participation. I think we have somewhat of a branding issue where this has always been under the rooftop of the Northwest Power Pool, but it really is a Westwide effort. And I would say to end, you know, this is about continuous improvement. We can always do more. We can always do better. I appreciate the comments from the panelists today, and I will take that back to the team. Thank you very much, Ms. Edmonds. Commissioner Clements, back to you. Thank you. Um, the, the, the One of the things that just got mentioned with the um, these institutions, WEC, uh, Krepsi, YRAB, and others, I guess I always thought that there was, uh, in the West, a lot of shared information and um, similar metrics used in modeling studies and I've, interest, I've been interested to hear several different people mention that that's an issue. And so I just wanted to ask um, if from a either a transmission, uh, excuse me, a information transparency perspective or from a shared metrics and inputs perspective, do you have any recommendations on ways that things might improve um, relative to the resource adequacy goals and beyond? I bet somebody has an idea. Ms. Edmonds? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clements. That's our, our whole goal is common metrics and common assumptions. Assumptions are always uh, just a reasonable best guess. They're never perfect, but wouldn't it be such a major step forward for this region if we were all using the same thing? Earlier panelists, remar panelists remarked about we just don't know the depth of the market. We don't know how much front office transactions we can rely on. We will still be using assumptions to do a regional RA program, but it will all be the same assumptions. Similarly, on counting resources, our hope is to use similar counting metrics for these resources. And I can't underscore enough what a major shift and change that is for this part of the West. And I am very excited for that step forward, let alone adding on the additional functionality of the ability to share in the diversity of that capacity. Thank you very much, Ms. Edmonds. We'll just go on the queue now. Uh, Mr. Miller, you're next. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I, I think um, I want to reference that I do appreciate uh, what the Northwest Power Pool has done, the efforts, the current efforts. 
Um, uh, and I and I so I want to echo what uh, what Ms. Evans is saying. They've made made tremendous strides in terms of the base definitional um, nomenclature issues, as far as I can tell. Um, uh, again, it, it, it's it's they're they're still a, a relatively small group uh, at the moment, but from what we can tell, they've made great. Uh, strides in that regard and so that that's fantastic um i can reference that as opposed to um when i was on staff at your commission back uh during the time of the crisis and we would go to wex predecessor and ask them for information they had very little ways of sort of giving us a a, a file that would be useful uh, in, in terms of information. So they have made tremendous strides, and I think the you know that in and of itself is going to be key. I I do think that sharing that information and then how that gets translated to a large organization uh, like California uh, is going to be key, and to make sure that there is um uh, shared definitions because this as we found in the last crisis, the CPUC had ways of defining things and nomenclature and Kaiso had a different one and uh, it, 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 it ran into difficulties. And when we're talking about tight, scarce resources as we are right now, um, being able to communicate in the same language is going to be key. Um, so while I laud what Northwest Power Pool has done, I'm concerned about how that gets translated across, uh, across Lake Tahoe. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Mr. Griffiths, please go ahead. Yeah, I got to say, I, 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 there, there is the need for basically having um, the commonality and the understanding and the information flow. Um, but as has having lived through a lot of the way our resource adequacy works and accounting rules and those sorts of things, um, you know, there the challenges are going to be fairly significant. Um, for example. Um, you know, we heard a lot yesterday about the ELCC, electric load carrying capability methodology of counting. Um, that counting methodology is completely dependent upon the the um, the portfolio for which you're looking at and and the area that you're looking at. And so, um, you know, a a resource could have a certain value in one portfolio, but if you add some more resources or you add a re different region to it it essentially could change the counting for, for that for resource adequacy purposes. Those are types of challenges that I think are going to be faced uh, in implementation that are fairly significant challenges uh, and should not be underestimated. So while there is a desire to move quickly, there are a lot of challenges that are, that are, are, that are lay in wait and will need to be addressed. Um, from, from my perspective and from California's perspective, you know, please learn from California. Uh, we haven't done things uh, perfectly well in the RA uh, structure, but we have learned a lot of lessons. And so um, from, from my perspective, I think we're all willing and, and able to, to provide the information that we have gotten and in, in the lessons we've learned uh, in going through this process. Thank you very much. Mr. Johnson, please go ahead. Uh, just wanted to share a perspective from the transmission planning that in, in that area we do have pretty good data sets that are coordinated through WEC uh, and and with input from the regional planning organizations and the individual utilities for for things like power flow and production cost modeling and and those data sets for the you know cover the whole interconnection and are a really good starting point for our planning studies so that that's a potential area of opportunity to 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 look toward if maybe on the, the resource adequacy side acknowledging that there's some you know there's some technical issues like with the, the ELCCs that would have to be worked out uh, thank you mr. Johnson uh, next we have Ms. Beck please go ahead thank you um, I would echo a lot of what's been said already I I have two other things that I would want to raise as um, Challenging, but uh, you know potential benefits if we could if we could get there, and um, that is the data uh, availability. 
So I, I know there's going to be a challenge of how much of it's going to be confidential and can you anonymize it? But to me, I think uh, um, there's a, a lot of potential benefit to be able to have access to data in a way that um, stakeholders haven't had. So I would hope that we were at least aiming for that, even though I know it is a challenge. And then the other thing that I would um, hope for would be um, some of the benefits of independence. Because um, some of the things right now where there's um, some data that's being collected, I feel like it's a little bit of a just adding up what the utilities want and um, and having like this independent standard um, might give it a, a chance to kind of have a little additional scrutiny to make sure there aren't um, um, uh, I don't know just uh, some of the some of the weaknesses that might be in the system could be ferreted out from having that independence. So I would look toward that. Thank you, Ms. Beck. Uh, Mr. Wright, please go ahead next. I think you're muted, Mr. Wright. Thank you, Naveen. Um, competitive markets have done a lot of good things for us. They've sent us price signals that allow us to operate more efficiently. But on the other hand, I'm old enough to remember that we used to share data more than we do now. Um, because candidly, there's, uh, you know, we're uh, both collaborators and competitors in the markets these days. And uh, we actually need uh, third parties to be created, like the PowerPool program, in order to be able to share data and anonymize it and be able to uh, uh, not be concerned about proprietary business concerns. So that's one issue that the uh, PowerPool solves. The second is, candidly, we are all facing a data explosion, just so much more data, um, all useful, and then trying to figure out how to pull it together and use it. And we need bodies to help us to do that. So to me, um, I think about the PowerPool RA program as a way to, to actually pull this together in a way that will actually create dashboards at the regional level for us that we lack today. Um, we really need that to be pulled together and have people who are sitting there sifting through it and turning it into useful information that can allow us to take actions. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Uh, Mr. Hewitt, please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, this is a topic of a data topic is of particular interest to me, and I know it was part of the question. So let me just give a very brief uh, uh, view on that. As I mentioned in my uh, opening remarks, I think there are multiple aspects to this: data quality, very important; availability. We've had some discussion of that just now. Uh, protection of that data and security. Uh, these are all interacted, you know, interactive issues, and you have to make really uh, difficult trade-offs. But I think that uh, we can see, uh, and again, I mentioned WEC, there's a, uh, I think that represents a success story. Uh, and let me just talk about that for a moment. Uh, there, uh, WEC has responsibilities to collect data under the NERC uh, Mod 31 and 32 uh, reliability standards uh, to support uh, transmission planning standards for doing base case studies and also for long-term studies. There's a lot of difficulty in collecting the data and then in making it consistent, uh, finding the gaps and uh, creating an authoritative data set that not only is used by WEC, but can also be used by the rest of the region. Uh, WEC has uh, taken an approach called the anchor data set to do that. It's taken several years to put it together, lots of complex issues to deal with, of chasing down details. But now that represents a very important source, authoritative source that supports reliability and resource adequacy studies including the Western assessment of resource adequacy that we heard about yesterday. And that kind of coordination, I think, as I said before, helps provide a technical underpinning for everything else we're doing to support and enhance resource adequacy. So again, I just wanted to point out that cooperation and hard work and uh, you know really digging in does produce results and we have a success there. Thank you, Mr. Hewitt. Commissioner Clements, back to you. Thanks, Naveen. Um, I have one question, but I'll hold it to the end if there's a few extra minutes so that the other, uh, so that Commissioner Christie has sufficient time. Uh, I don't have any questions right now. I've been listening to all the talk about the Northwest Power Pool, which is very interesting, and I look forward to hearing more about it, but I have no questions right now. Okay, so uh, thank you. I'll ask my other question. It's for Commissioner Cordova. Um, you talked about the legislation that's recent uh, related to requiring participation in a regional transmission organization. Um, and I don't want to put you on the spot since it's brand new. I'm curious if you, what you think about 
the biggest challenges um, in Nevada to, to, to take those steps or how you're thinking about what the steps are to analyze uh, the, the end goal there. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so there's not a lot I can say in part because it is kind of brand new legislation. We haven't really done anything to implement it. Um, and also at some point it will come before the commission as a discussion. But I do think that the the, the goal here is regionalization. I mean, this, that was the thrust of the legislation. We are going to be spending billions of dollars of ratepayer money um, to build new transmission lines. And so we want to leverage those best that we can for the interconnection in the West. Um, and so, um, I was not involved in drafting the legislation, so I don't know, you know, what conversations occurred during that process, but certainly a goal of better regionalization, um, I think, is what that legislation is for. It's not necessarily outlining that the end goal for Nevada is an RTO in the Western United States. Um, and so, um, certainly our experience at the Nevada Commission has been that um, it is challenging to work with the various states in the West with their varying goals and come up with a common conversation. Um, and that, you know, certainly we're talking about that today. We were talking about that yesterday. Um, but I do think that the, the goal of that legislation is to get us to a place where we are interacting in a greater fashion regionally than we are right now. Um, you know, there's certainly, um, you know, frustration for us when we, um, can't get information about what's going on in other states. And uh, and as I think, I can't remember who it was exactly that said, but I think it might have been my fellow commissioner um, from Idaho, but it's hard to stay on top of all of that. There's a lot going on in the West. Um, and so I do think that um, we're going to move towards trying to be more engaged at the Nevada Commission in some of those activities. Thank you. That's all for me, Naveen. Thank you, Commissioner Clements. Chairman Rick, back to you. Thanks, Naveen. Um, I, I, um, I'm going to defer back to you to see if you or anybody on your team has any additional questions before we have to finish up in a few minutes. Thank you, Chairman Glick. Um, I'll turn it over to my eminent colleague, Bob Hellrick Dawson, for some staff led inquiries. Bob, please go ahead. Thanks, Naveen. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I, I sort of hit on a question I wanted to ask about what I think is sort of uh, maybe the perfect becoming the enemy of getting anything done at all. Um, so I've heard a couple of things. So we have the Northwest Power Pool RA program, which has a lot of people signed on to it, a lot of BA, a lot of utilities. So I take that to mean there's a lot of comfort there. That seems to work for people. Um, I've heard a lot in hallway conversations, for those of you that don't know, I actually work out here in California, uh, right next to the California ISO, so I get the chance to talk to people pre-pandemic um, at meetings. I've heard a lot of people say they like the way, for instance, SPP's governance structure works with its uh, regional states committee. Uh, the regional states committee has control over transmission, for instance. Um, I think it was Commissioner Raper just mentioned that the EIM governing body is a good I think you might have set a starting point or something for looking at governance. Why is it not possible to say, okay, here's our RA program, here's our governance structure, here's the way six other ISOs already uh, do a day ahead and real time market structure, including all the reliability runs, all that technical details. Here's our package, there's the proposal. Who would like to join? Question for anybody. Mr. Fred, it looks like your hands up. Hi there. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I'll hazard a you know a jump in this uh, to start with. Uh, we've uh, we and our colleagues in the West, uh, many organizations, uh, get together and talk about these issues. Now, where are we going, and what governance structures do we as uh, environmental and clean energy advocates prefer? And we have we find around the country. A good examples from all the different regions and also some concerns. Uh, you mentioned, for example, the SPP governance. Um, I think that the, the regional states committee uh, structure has some advantages to it. We're concerned about the uh, inclusion aspect at SPP, whether 
uh, non-members, non-market participants, and then of course the states, uh, what role that we have in their structure. Uh, we look at the California ISO and see a very open structure. They don't have formal membership or membership classes. Um, they have an EIM governance, uh, uh, governing body nomination approach, which is very open, balanced, provides a lot of input. It's been very successful. Uh, we like that model. Uh, we see some aspects of some of the RTOs in the East that have good governance uh, uh, elements to them. I think what we're really trying to uh, think about is, again, thinking of the theme about the future grid is what kind of lessons learned can we take from all of those and devise something that is, if you want a, a phrase for it, best for the West, that finds the right balance between state policy interests, the uh, uh, the necessity of pulling together a very diverse industry, as Steve Wright mentioned, with both public uh, power and investor-owned utilities. We also have two large power marketing authorities, WAPA and Bonneville Power Administration, and we have Canadian provinces in that portion of Baja, Mexico. It's a complex uh, governance context, and yet we have seen some success. So the question is, what? where do we find the right balance to provide the institutional context that helps us get to a better grid. Now, that's the way we're thinking about it. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Hewitt. Mr. Wright, please go ahead, you're next. I mean, I couldn't quite hear you. Was that for me, next? Yes, it is for you, Mr. Wright. Go ahead, please. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, first of all, Fred, that was a great answer. <laughs> I think you said about two thirds of what I was gonna say. Um, so I'll only do the final one third, which is, you know, the problem, of course, with that approach would be who's the group that's going to decide what the uh, the package is of things that we've learned from others and then say to everybody, here it is, come sign up for it. And, you know, we're accustomed to in the West and particularly in the Northwest, a process where we all sit down and talk about that. Um, what can we learn from the uh, the commission's decisions on the Southwest Power Pool governance structure and uh, talking to the Southwest Power Pool itself um, and looking to the different uh, RA structures that have been put in place in different places. So we're basically on a journey of learning and we're trying to go with as many people as we can and people who uh, are interested and want to take the time to join us and then out of that uh, to find the, the final game, end game. Um, I do want to make one point. While I personally and I think uh, the people you are hearing from are very optimistic about the Northwest Power Pool RA program, we still have decisions that have to be made that are going to be difficult decisions. I don't want to have people thinking that, oh, great, so we're there on RA, now we can move to the next step. We still have some hard work to do. Uh, I can see ways that we can get through all of that, and I believe we will be successful, but I know we still got the work to do. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Commissioner Raper, you're next. Please go ahead. Thank you, and thank you for the question. And I kind of laughed when you asked it because um, much of the conversation of this panel has been the frustration of being included in the conversation or not being included in the conversation. And it sounded like your proposition was not being included in the conversation, present it and see who goes for it, right? And the best example of that that I would give for the West recently, and this is, my limited knowledge, right, from a 30,000 foot level as a commissioner, but, um, and if I'm wrong, anyone on the panel, feel free to correct me, and I know that you will, but at the same time that the EIM, governing, governing body, and that um, was coming together, which was a bottom-up approach, right, everybody talking, stakeholders involved, there was also a Mountain West transmission group, and that looked, from my perspective, that looked more like a top-down approach that they were doing to how they were trying to put that together and which entity exists now the EIM governing body exists now and i don't know all the reasons that the mountain west transmission group did not come to fruition but i know that i watched those two things do this right as as the dialogue was going on and i know that those of us in the west felt more comfortable as the eim governing body and their role developed and quite frankly, the commissioner's roles in that um, because we were part of it, as opposed to having a structure imposed on you. And then the utilities are put in a bind, I think, because they can't just say yes. They have to bring it in front of their commissions, right? And say, can we do this? Because they're gonna seek to recover those costs from the state commissions. And so 
the what I have seen be successful is the bottom up approach. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Cordova, you're next. Please go ahead. Thank you. Super excited to follow Commissioner Raper on those thoughts. I, I really have two thoughts on this question because it's an excellent question. And, and one of those is I think in California, and if I'm being perfectly frank, for a very long time, we were um, looking to the California ISO as an opportunity for the state of Nevada. Um, the, they've struggled mightily with their governance issues. Um, they've made some progress with EIM. We are members of the EIM. But it's becoming more and more clear that um, you know California is not going to be a solution to Nevada's problems. And it's not fair to expect that they would be. Um, but by the same token, we are a very, very small state. And so when we look at these questions, the question really is, who's going to do all the work and who's going to pay for all of what you're talking about? Let's put together a proposal in a package because certainly at the Nevada Commission and at some of our utilities, we do not have the resources to do that work. And then it's almost, and my colleagues here in Nevada laugh at me because I say this a lot, it's, it's like the Kevin Costner Field of Dreams movie. What if you build it and nobody comes, right? We can't just build it and just hope that people are gonna show up on, onto our baseball field. Um, we certainly don't have the resources in a very small state to engage in something like that. Um, and so that's why I think following on Commissioner Raper's comments that you know, kind of building a bottom up approach um, makes everyone a little bit more comfortable um, as a result of that. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Ms. Edmonds, please go ahead. Great, Bob, I'm gonna give you an answer from the mind, the wallet and the heart. So from the mind, from a legal perspective, full RTO, full grid optimization, market optimization is turning over operational control and transferring balancing authority area responsibilities to another entity, necessitating specific regulatory approvals. That's a big lift. Wallet. The West has always been fearful about grid integration and transmission integration because we have long spindly expensive systems and transmission cost allocation has always been part of the fear of marrying up and then finally heart we've talked so much today about trust building about the fear of losing control and i really liked uh what mr wright said we're on a journey here i think we're moving towards all of those pieces but they are real and significant for this culture out here in the West. Thank you very much, Ms. Edmonds. Uh, Bob, back to you. Thanks, Naveen, and thanks everybody for your answers. It's really useful to hear that. I, uh, from perspective, I'm an economist. I deal with asymmetric information and market design. So it's, uh, you know, I kind of think, let's get the ball rolling. Why can't somebody put the project together and you know, it doesn't have to be the Nevada Commission that spends, uh, you know, $20 million doing it, but just in the coffee shop, say here, who wants to sign on? Um, not realistic. That's fine, I guess. Um, uh, so let me let me shift gears completely. Um, actually, Ms. Edmonds, Sarah, if I can turn back to you, can you talk a little bit about the Northwest Power Pool RA programs? Um, and specifically, what I'm wondering about is the very last phase that you've described, um, Greg Carrington described it a little bit yesterday, but not a lot. And that's a sort of sharing event process that could happen. And it sounds to me a lot like, um, it kind of sounds like uh, real time, uh, real not, not real time optimization, but something like that. Can you talk a little bit about that and how it worked? Maybe you don't know yet. Yeah, very briefly. I mean, we, I think yesterday, I hope it was made clear that we're launching this program in stages. The functionality rolls out over time. And that's a really important aspect of our design because it gives parties the opportunity to understand what participation means, both in terms of potential operations, potential costs and savings over a period of time when we're not imposing compliance penalties. So that's stage one, which is the non-binding forward showing program. Then we move into a binding forward showing program. We call that stage two, where the compliance penalties get attached. Very importantly, Stage three is the operational overlay. That is when we add on functionality to allow us to share in the diversity of those resources, potentially in the day ahead timeframe when the picture becomes more clear about what actual operations will look like. I made my remarks earlier today that at this point, absent a future market solution that we really hope will be there for us when we need it, we intend to support that operational framework with bilateral trading, potentially new platforms, bulletins, 
other uses of WSPP products that we are currently thinking our way through. So there is a to be determined element here to your question. But we, like I said before, we didn't want to wait for a full economic optimization solution to move forward. We've got a lot to do and a lot to learn before we get to that stage. Okay, thanks. So it's, it's pretty undefined at this point. Okay. Um, along those lines, uh, uh, Mr. Miller, you mentioned earlier maybe having a bulletin board or some, some sort of information that would be tra more transparent and provide information on pricing and availability across the West of, of generating capacity. How, how would that differ from, say, the existing trading hubs in the price index reporting that we see from ICE and other groups? Um, thanks, uh, Bob, for the question. Uh, the current reporting is an energy report uh, on day ahead prices um, at the very, at like me, Palo Verde, uh, Mid Sea. Um, and so those are, you know, it, it, it's interesting because at some point when we talk about RA and this gets to deliverability and feasibility, at some point it does have to become energy when you need it. Um, but the RA price is is intended to be something entirely separate. Think of it, uh, think of it as a uh, you know cost for uh, stored natural gas or or a proxy for storage, or you know something to be used in the future. Um, it's it's entirely it, at that point, it's entirely different than a price for energy. Uh, thanks, uh, Peter. It looks like you got your hand up too. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to say certainly one of the features of, of any RA structure for the most part is the forwardness of the of the program. Um, certainly there has to be a showing that there is capacity that is that is on a has been procured on a forward basis, essentially to be available when needed. Um, certainly in California, that is done on a monthly basis. The RA step is a monthly a monthly product. Uh, as I understand that what the uh, Pacific Northwest is looking at is um, is a seasonal basis where there has to be procurement done and shown uh, on a seasonal basis so that it's very much a capacity type of uh, of product so right now uh, because there is different sort of showing and steps um, it's not possible necessarily to put forward a single price for a forward product per se um, because across the west largely because of the fact that the steps for the requirements are are different or could be different and that's one thing that we would probably want to try and marry together or less sync up across RA programs is sort of what is that forward requirement and, and can there be a standardized product that will be able to meet that, that requirement uh, on a forward basis. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Fred, looks like you've got your hand up too. Yeah, so if I may, a couple of thoughts. One is, uh, one of the uh, things I think going forward is to provide more transparency in the process, both on the energy and capacity side. Right now, Mid-Sea is the largest uh, trading hub in the West, but we uh, who are not in the market have no visibility on a day-by-day -day basis into that, yet it's really crucially important. One of the big questions I have is what the Mid-Sea price is going to be next Monday. It has direct implications for uh, customers in terms of what our bills are going to be going forward. And not to mention that it's very important to understand the shape of these markets and shaping the conditions that we're in and the ability to, to serve load. Uh, the second thing is thinking ahead you know, forward, uh, the role of price in uh, shaping what we do and how our market designs uh, are evolving in a context of a very rapidly changing resource mix is really a fundamental issue. This is a point I raised in the written submission that I think we will want to go back to. Uh, resource adequacy cannot be considered distinct from market design, in my opinion. Thanks. Thanks, Fred. Scott, did you uh, put your hand up again? Did you have something else? You're muted. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I did. I did want to under underpin that this again. You know, once you're in an RTO, the 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 RA product can become regionalized and around hubs. There is an issue, uh, and, and that's why I proposed a bulletin board issue. There's a there's there's the issue about sort of keeping um, um, information uh, appropriately, and that's why reporting it to an independent entity 
that describes it on a regional basis rather than individual companies is kind of key to maintaining um, uh, the, the sort of sanctity of that information. But it's an easy way to do it, uh, or uh, but it is it's not the best you know the best solution. All right, thanks, Scott. Um, one final question. Um, so we've heard a lot about the need uh, for flexibility in our resources as we uh, integrate more renewable resources into the system. Um, and it's my understanding that in the Western US, outside of KISO, bilateral scheduling is done hourly, primarily. Um, it, to what point or to what degree is that a hindrance of ensuring that we get the flexibility west wide and can be able to share the way we need to to maintain not you know gross peak for a month but get that the energy when it's needed where it's needed exactly and and, and if it is a problem then how do we move away from hourly scheduling in the west to sub hourly to 15 or whatever it is fred all right we got to take her Again, if I may, the energy imbalance market uh, brought yeah. the ability to do residual uh, energy imbalance, uh, you know, at a five-minute or 15-minute granularity, very important because it got all the EIM participants to upgrade their systems. That makes it possible now to move much more quickly to uh, into the hourly and day-ahead uh, context. The California ISO is, uh, I, I think we're going to be seeing more uh, another effort to continue developing the enhanced day ahead market we see that as you know have, obviously we have to see the details but uh, we're very uh, supportive of that effort because it will give us the next building block the next stepping stone on the energy side and as i said before one of the questions that we have is how to align that effort that incremental effort make it faster you know kind of accelerated incrementalism so we will now have a capacity side with the uh, Northwest Power Pool RA program, potentially the enhanced day ahead market. How do we use those building blocks to move forward in a faster way? Okay, thanks. Yeah, so the, the EIM is really a tiny, tiny little slice off the top of all the trading, you know, west wide. So it sounds like relying or at least hoping for those day ahead market enhancements in the expanded day ahead market out of ISO is what you're saying. Um, Peter, looks like your hand's up. Yeah, I would agree with I would agree with what Fred just said in terms of the EIM really does play the role of providing a a, a forum for uh, essentially uh, for sort of inter hour adjustments in terms of to load it to to load and and resource needs and that's a real service that I think has been being provided um, to all of the all of the entities within the West, which is why I think there is some hope essentially that we can essentially move from that to moving to something that might be a little fuller you're you're absolutely right that not very much uh energy is transacted in that eim time frame but it is an important part of essentially building the trust and essentially building the way that they're, they're the, the markets operate so that maybe we can get to an extended day head market where we can widen that and have a greater a greater trading on the of the energy that's that needs to be traded thanks peter scott um thanks bob the 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 problem and i don't want to besmirch the eim it's done great things it's familiarized people it's updated their uh their systems it's done great things that it was supposed to do however it still is a uh, transmission that is uh offered in most cases uh by the by the utilities they control the transmission it it um it, unless you get to an RTO, it's going to be very, very difficult for any for any real um, robust usage. Even in an, I, I and I struggle with thinking what an extended day ahead market that where which is not dispatched by an independent entity will look like in terms of transmission being used by people who I, who own generation. Um, you know the capabilities certainly exist for pricing sub hourly. We, we know that um, it is difficult to get to that unless you allocate transmission on a non-discriminatory basis. All right, thanks, Scott. Uh, Naveen, let me turn it over to you. Looks like I've I've run over. 
Thank you very much, Bob, and thank you to all the participants. Um, as Bob noted, we're at 2.33 p.m., so we will conclude panel three for now. Thank you very much for everybody who participated, um, to all the commissioners and to all the speakers and staff as well. We will now do a 15-minute break. We'll begin our next panel after a 15-minute break at 2.50 p.m. That's 5-0, um, about 17 minutes from now. Panel three panelists, please sign out of the WebEx meeting and remember to exit so that the panel four can get online. If you'd like to continue watching the conference, you may use the public webcast link on the conference page at FERC.gov. Um, chairman and commissioners can stay online. Panelists for panel four, please uh, begin to come online now. And we ask that you sign on by 2.40 p.m. We'll run through technical checks then. See you all soon. We'll go on break now. Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome again back to the conference. My name is Naveen Shaker, and I'm from the Commission's Office of Energy Market Regulation. We're about to get started with the fourth and final panel of this conference on resource adequacy development in the Western interconnection. This last panel is entitled Dis Regional Coordination Within the Western Interconnection. In order to maximize the discussion time and due to the potential breadth of systemic topics in the segment, we have foregone opening remarks for this panel and we move directly into a question and answer session with the commissioners. Before that, I would like to start by introducing all of the speakers on our panel four. In alphabetical order, we have Jeff Ackerman, who is Senior Policy Advisor at the Center for New Energy Economy at Colorado State University and recently from the Colorado Public Utilities Commission. Scott Bolton, Senior Vice President, Transmission Development at Pacifico. John Hairston, who is Administrator and CEO at the Bonneville Power Administration. Tracy Lebeau, who is Interim Administrator and CEO at the Western Area Power Administration. Elliot Mainzer, President and CEO of California Independent System Operator Corporation, KISO. Amanda Ormond, Director at Western Grid Group. Ed Randolph, Deputy Executive Director for Energy and Climate Policy at the California Public Utilities Commission. Bruce Rue, who is Senior Vice President of Operations at Southwest Power Pool, Commissioner Lee Tatani of the Oregon Public Utility Commission, and finally, Jordan White, who we heard from yesterday, who is Vice President of Strategic Engagement and Deputy General Counsel of the Western Electricity Coordinating Council, or WEC. As we begin, I would like to remind all participants um, to refrain from discussing specific details or merits of, the pen of any pending contested commission proceedings. If anybody happens on such matters, my colleague Colin Beckman from the Office of General Counsel might interject to ask you to avoid that topic. We will now begin the question and answer session. As before, please um, answer and unmute yourself and answer if a question is directed at you directly. If a panelist would like to respond to a general question directed towards the panel, please use the raise hand function on WebEx and you can call on you sequentially. If not, please unmute yourself and let us know you would like to answer. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the commissioners. Chairman Good, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Naveen. I really appreciate it. And uh, I want to thank all the panelists for, on this panel for participating today. Um, we had, we've had three great panels today. We have a terrific panel to close out with today. I think we're going to have a very interesting discussion. I did want to point out, though, that I, um, due to some scheduling uh, conflicts, I have to step aside for about a half hour and then in another hour, I'll come back for an hour and then I might, have to step, I might miss the last couple of minutes as well. But um, I want to thank you all and I will be back in a bit. But for, for now, Commissioner Clements is going to leave this particular panel. I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Clements. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Glick. Uh, so, what a great group of panelists. Thank you for taking the time this afternoon. And I, we've heard so much uh, so far and looking forward to you all helping us uh, process and, and, and refine the takeaways that you think we should be left with at the end of this conversation. Um, the, we could go from big to little or little to big here. And I think with hopes that the chairman will be, will be back in time for the big. Um, let's start with, if we're thinking about the buckets of resource adequacy, and then how they relate to transmission system planning, regional coordination, as well as um, developing markets, uh, opportunities and coordination. First, it would be great to get uh, each of your perspectives on the state of play on resource adequacy 
um, as you see it from your uh, from your vantage point or the organization that you represent vantage point and the, the one priority you have for reform or change or doubling down looking forward for the next 10 to 20 years. Uh. Ms. Orman, I first, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, first, I just wanted to make the statement that Western Grid Group supports a fully integrated regional transmission organization in the West with the broadest footprint possible because that's where we'll see the greatest consumer benefits and that's where we'll see the greatest reliability. Um, there has been great discussion throughout the last two days about RA and we're very excited about the Northwest Power Pool and what has happened there. Uh, one of the points that didn't really come out very much is the fact that the Arizona utilities, New Mexico, and El Paso are, are not fully engaged in that process. Uh, there was a map shown. And the utilities in the Southwest are starting to do a study themselves to look at RA. Uh, what will come out of that study, how the results of that study will be fed into a broader RA discussion is really unknown at this time. And so I think it's something that we need to watch. One of the other speakers had mentioned that California is not really participating so much in the RA program. So I just wanted to uh, advocate for inclusivity and for our utilities in the Southwest to be participating because we want to minimize themes. We want to minimize uh, differences between uh, different balancing authorities and create the most uniformity that we can. Thank you for those comments. Mr. Ackerman, did I see your hand up? Or yeah, thank you, Naveen. Uh, commissioners, Chairman, pleasure to be with you. Uh, on behalf of the, the Center for the New Energy Economy, which uh, former Governor Ritter launched uh, a decade ago and really prides itself on kind of working in that space of how do you facilitate tough discourse. I think, uh, and agreeing with what Amanda said, there's been great discourse today, yesterday, bringing out some of the key parts of resource adequacy in terms of uh, understanding commonality of metrics and measurements and and uh, and nomenclature. I think one of the things that I would bring to mind in this conversation and what we're hearing as we go about engaging in a regional dialogue is sometimes the nature of uh, a tough issue is often uh, in a backwards way better managed if you make it a larger issue. So I would say that sometimes resource adequacy needs to be looked at not only in the complications that it offers, but how does it fit into a larger vision of what are we trying to do in the West? Uh, so as you mentioned, Commissioner, of how it, you know, how does that fit into transmission planning? How does it fit into administration? All those pieces. And I think the piece that I would bring to that conversation that fits in there is that um, possibly one of the key links here is the is the overt policy voice. I heard it mentioned a little bit from the commissioner from the California Energy Commission would remind us yesterday that he was a, you know, bringing in the policy voice. But I think understanding as a former policy advisor, cabinet officer to a governor, uh, the role governors have in this conversation and, and that the criticality of getting that voice in there to kind of make sure that we don't go about building really good resource adequacy, but blind to whether it is fitting well with how transmission planning's evolved and the other quarter successor to wherever we go next with four quarter 1000, how we evolve in those issues. So it's done in sync. It won't all be perfect, it won't all happen all at once. But if there's a way that we make sure that we understand there's a bigger vision here and a bigger need for regional collaboration on that, um, that's what I think will drive uh, like the best outcomes, for example, from the Northwest Power Pool or elsewhere. Thank you very much, Mr. Ackerman. Commissioner Tony, your next go ahead, please. Thank you so much. And thank you, Chair and Commissioners, for convening the last uh, two days. I've learned a great deal and I appreciate being uh, able to join you this afternoon. The state of play today, I think you've heard really clearly I, and echoes my experience in Oregon. We're relatively blind outside our, our integrated resource plan. There's gaps in our understanding um, and there is a process and we see that there is a substantial resource adequacy issue um, heading towards us and it's abundantly clear that cooperating is to our benefit, that we'll avoid overbuilding, 
uh, that it's good for our customers to engage in this conversation. And I, I think you heard that in the prior panel. Oregon, too, is a small commission, and, and like our colleagues in Idaho and Nevada and across the West, so we're straining to stay engaged effectively because this is such an important conversation. I think the, um, the priority change or the benefit I look forward to the most uh, beyond, obviously, the opportunity to not overbuild is the transparency, is the ability to really have a handle on what's happening outside our borders and to have a structured dialogue with my colleagues in other states, uh, other policymakers around what the capital stock turnover looks like, what they anticipate in response to either their legislatures or their governors or just the economics that they see in the renewable deployment, whether they have a, a, an explicit energy policy in their state or, or not. So I very much look forward to that um, opportunity to have a, a apples to apples conversation, <clears throat> recognizing that there will continue to be a challenge in bridging to the California RA system, which has its own history and, and we'll all need some sort of clever cheat sheet or uh, translation table so that we can have that conversation. But I, I, think, I think that's possible and I look forward to it. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Mr. White, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, and thank you, uh, Chairman and Commissioners, for uh, hosting this conference. Um, the one thing that's unique about the technical conference I've um, listened with great interest and intent over the past couple of days is that it's unique in the sense that we have a violent agreement uh, with respect to, A, the urgency, uh, the resource adequacy issues in the West right now, and really what the solutions are, which is a regional approach. Um, WEC completely agrees with that. We also recognize with a high degree of variability um, on the system in our interconnectedness that we've had and we've enjoyed as a benefit over the years, we have to now more than ever step up to the plate and work together to really to have that sharing of data and collaboration that is so necessary at this time. The question is, we have um, a lot of evolving efforts in this, in this area, um, evolving market efforts, the Northwest Power Pool we've heard a lot about. The one thing we don't have at this point is a centralizing focus to really do a thorough um, gaps and overlaps analysis to really figure out what the best path forward is to really um, approach this uh, issue head on for the good of the 80 million customers that depend on this. And so I'm excited about it, but I think I recognize the, the kind of, I guess the, the question that the 800 you know, pound um, elephant of the room, which is what is gonna bring this disparate, um, these efforts together? We all want the same result. We recognize the, the tools and approach but we do need that centralizing focus. So um, I'm looking forward to this discussion today, but, but again, I, I recognize that is what I see right now at the state of play, which is agreement. A lot of trust building has occurred over the past five or six years with the, with the development and the trust building with the EIM, et cetera, but um, we are getting closer, but we, we need that kind of uh, last mile thinking to get us there to actually bring um, together the full force and effect of all of the good minds and thinking and, and energies we have in the West. So thank you, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much for that response, Mr. White. Uh, Mr. Harrison, please go ahead, you're next. Yes, um, good afternoon and, and thanks a lot for that question, Commissioner. I, you know, you, you asked part of the question was about what our focus would be uh, moving forward around resource adequacy. And, and I'll say this, you know, um, Representing Bonneville and having a system there, you know, we've got 15,000 miles of, of high voltage transmission and, and close to 23,000 megawatts of um, capacity. It's, it's interesting that a lot of times our customers feel like we could go it alone. You know, we don't really need to coordinate with others to uh, meet our needs moving out in the future. But, but you know, it's important that we work together. Um, I don't really think anyone can go it alone given what we've got to confront you know, the nearly 18,000 uh, megawatts of generation that's going to be taken offline by, you know, uh, 2040. And so uh, this is an urgency uh, for us to get together as utilities and make sure that we're working together. Um, for me, I think that, you know, there's a lot of discussion around RTO and that's important because there's certainly efficiencies to be gained in that type of a market. However, um, you know, we've really done things well when we've done them incrementally. And I see some of the steps that we're taking right now, um, you know, that are important steps 
could actually get us to that conversation. But if you look at what we've done in terms of our transmission planning around Northern Grid, uh, the steps that we're taking around uh, potentially the EIM and seeing growth in the participation in the EIM market, as well as this program development um, that's under the Northwest Power uh, Pool. Um, I think those are really solid steps that would lead us, you know, once we gain experience to really having some experience in building that trust around potentially taking that next step to, um, you know, an RTO. Uh, but for me right now, um, our perspective is one, evaluating um, our next step in potentially participating in the EIM, and then working really closely with the uh, PowerPool, who I must say is doing a tremendous job. Um, Frank um, Afrangi and the team has really done a great job pulling us together and working on the, the elements that are serious uh, or critical to us in terms of standing up this program. So uh, we're actively participating and encouraged about what we're seeing, but think this is a necessary first step and experience in terms of um, you know, considering other um, steps down the road in respect to an RTO. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, Ms. Lago, go ahead, your next speech. Hi, good afternoon. I want to thank the commission for uh, putting together this, uh, this technical conference. It's been really uh, illuminating to hear all the different perspectives, so really appreciate that. And yeah, I think Jordan uh, stole my uh, stole what I was going to talk about a little bit. In that, you know, I, the one thing I one of my takeaways is that we are in some manner of violent agreement. Um, that certainly that re RA is one of the biggest challenges uh, facing all of us in the West. And for Western area power, you know, it's affecting every region. And you know, we we span 15 states. So you know, from a an, on a business and operational side, we're watching, you know, and and uh, you know, uh, paying close attention to all the various you know proceedings um, that are happening across those 15 states, and we have to pay close attention to them and, and align with all of our customers um, as best we can um, to meet those types of requirements. You know, uh, you know, but on the we also, you know, as you well know, you know, we are also um, a government agency, and so from the government side, you know, I could say that you know they're you know putting on a, putting on that hat. Um, we're you know, it's interesting to think about kind of what our what is our role in this new world, um, and you know, certainly we were have been really um, you know dealing you know very, very actively dealing with a lot of the weather events that's happening and we've heard a lot, a lot about that in the last day or so um and, and how to incorporate those act you know those effects into our you know short term and our longer term planning you know we were so fortunate um to be in a position to pay um positive and a key role in mitigating widespread impacts of two recent energy emergencies and we did that by leveraging full capacity and operational uh, capabilities of our facilities. One was, you know, during um, last summer, um, and the you know we worked very closely and coordinated very closely uh, re with Reclamation, was able to supply um, you know hydro to California um, last August, and then earlier this year, uh, February fifteenth through eighteenth. Uh, we coordinated quite closely with the Army Corps of Engineers and delivered roughly 22,500 megawatt hours to Southwest Power Pool during the polar vortex. So, you know, we're, um, you know, uh, happy to play those roles, happy to do what we can. Um, you know, obviously, you know, all very focused on, you know, um, meet, you know, meeting our obligations and our priorities with our preference customers. Uh, but it also, you know, in this, you know, going forward, it's been, uh, it is certainly is something top of mind on, you know, how we can, uh, you know, how we can best gain some efficiencies out of the system while also recognizing we're facing unprecedented weather events. And so I'm looking forward to hearing, you know, more and more about that as, as in, gen in terms of general approach and how we incorporate that into our, uh, into our planning. So thanks. Thanks, Ms. Lebeau. Um, Mr. Rue, please go ahead. Yes, good afternoon, and thank you for hosting this conference. So 
I think fundamentally it starts with that everyone has to be a contributor. All the load serving entities need to have you know, sufficient uh, resource adequacy to contribute because it becomes an interconnection wide uh, operation. We're all in the interconnection together and you know, there's going to be times when we're short. I mean, just you know, whether it's cold weather or hot weather and you know, we're going to depend on others in the interconnection helping us. And by everyone being a contributor, that's what makes the interconnection successful. And I think programs like the Northwest Power Pool Resource Adequacy Program are a great start uh, to that sharing across the interconnection and being able to recognize what's available and how we can keep the lights on for everybody in those challenging situations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ruth. Mr. Bolton, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, first, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, um, it's a integrated planning and procurement and market framework, framework ensures, ensures sufficient, sufficient energy capacity, capacity and flexibility to help the state meet its clean energy goals and these are ambitious goals. The stakes could be higher, obviously, already into the mid of another, another very, very hot summer. And so working closely within the state, but I think increasingly important, if not more important, is the work across the Western interconnection. And we're very committed uh, to, uh, to working with, with our colleagues over the Northwest Power Pool, the other sub-regions, uh, to, uh, to share information, to try to make sure we all have a shared understanding of the load resource in the West, West and, and to try to develop some common currency uh, around accounting rules, uh, around, around sufficiency testing, and, and even to establish some common definitions around some of the resource adequacy and metrics, uh, including loss of loads, probabilities, which is becoming an increasingly important tool. Just a couple of thoughts. You know, the other thing, I think all of us, and we've been having some conversations with the wired effort uh, that we're sure we'll hear more about uh, even in this session uh, that's that's been sponsored by the Western Electric Industry Leaders Group and the Governor Rick. Very, very important dialogue in the West. I think we all recognize we don't have a chance of meeting these long term clean energy goals in a reliable fashion without additional transmission expansions, working inside California both to understand the needs within the state, but also working with adjacent states, governors, policymakers to try to accelerate and facilitate the construction and energization of some new transmission lines. I absolutely can't understate the importance of that. I really appreciated the increased federal attention on the top at this point. I think the, the commission's effort to facilitate greater dialogue uh, between the federal regulators and the states really, really important. Cost allocation issues are absolutely critical. And then finally, and then we'll have an opportunity to talk more. Certainly, you know, the greater integration of the markets in the West, second important top topics something incredibly vested in California and just um, you know I can't overstate you know I certainly having worked both outside of California and inside of California but sort of the cute where of both the operational governance challenges that we need to address to keep progressing together and and keeping our momentum so really appreciate the, the dialogue today and, and uh, to all of those of you in this conversation we look forward to really working hard together uh, in the months and years ahead thank you mr. Mainzer Mr. Randolph, can you please go ahead? Um, uh, thank you. And to echo others, I, I want to thank um, um, the commission and uh, the commission staff for putting on this conference today. It actually, and yesterday, it was very, um, panels have been very educational. Um, I, I want to start out um, by answering or responding to a broader question, just because we never know um, how the discussion will go the rest of the day. And I think it's important to emphasize as, um, you know, representing the California Public Utilities Commission and, you know, the the, the gorilla in the room sometimes um, that, you know, the commission, you know, broadly thinks that a um, you know, regional approach to energy planning, um, regional sharing of information, regional coordination, it's critical going forward. Um, and I mean, we we can see that from you know last summer. Um, we can see that from last week. I think we'll see that over the next few weeks, um, more and more how important it is um, for energy flowing um, in multiple directions um, out there. It, it will be cheaper for you know all of our ratepayers in the long term. 
um, and uh, quite frankly, helps us better integrate in um, the variable resources, the clean energy resources that are coming out there. Um, and I agree with a lot of the statements that have been made over the last two days that um, a key element of, of this over the uh, coming months, coming years, is this continuing um, effort to build trust among all the entities. Uh, you know, we all come to this from uh, different political perspectives. Uh, we come to this oftentimes from um, a different um, uh, por uh, portfolio um, that's available to us. Um, and then um, we need to trust each other that we're going to share information and we aren't out there to take advantage of each other. So and I, I see a lot of good efforts to build uh, trust out there and hopefully other people see that in California. Uh, to the very specific question that started this panel off and trying to keep it, um, or this question off, um, and uh, try to keep it small as we were talking about at the beginning in terms of state of play with RA, um, looking at it again more from a regional basis than just the California ISO or the California basis, uh, I mean, I, I think um, resource adequacy over the next few years is continue to be challenging for a no number of reasons. Um, and I'm more looking at it just from, you know, as we need to continue to shape the rules, set the rules, make sure the resources are there, there, there are some major challenges. Uh, they're driven by two things. Um, one is um, increased extreme weather. Um, and two is increased amounts of, of you know, variable resources or new uh, energy products that we've never seen before. Um, so on the weather, um, I think in California, we're very much learning. And I know from talking to colleagues across the, the West, the, the same thing, um, that um, our planning standards need to change. Uh, there's some talk about, you know, one and two, one and 10, um, one and 20 standards on other panels. Uh, but not only do you need to look at that, um, it, what, we've, what we're also very clearly seeing is it's no longer sufficient just to plan for your peak demand. Um, it's going to be critical to uh, plan for multiple hours of the day um, out there. And um, it's going to be critical that in that longer term planning that we can all share information about our assumptions, something that uh, you know, we've learned in California over the last few years is as we started talking to our colleagues in um, Oregon and Washington, um, you know, that what we were assuming would be available energy in those states, um, you know, load serving entities in those states were also looking at that same energy. Um, and as older plants retire across the West, um, there's less and less available energy across the West. And so I have seen cases where um, I think multiple load serving entities, when they're doing long-term plans, we're, you know, making assumptions that the exact same resources or resource types would be available for them. Um, and, you know, that's not going to work. Um, you know, and then the other issue more getting into the variable energy resources is as we get new um, uh, products out there, there's a lot of innovation going out there. You can see a lot of innovation in demand response and uh, battery storage and, you know, virtual power plants, all this other stuff that are very exciting. Um, but they don't fit the old school mold of resource adequacy. Um, and so it has been a struggle in California uh, to you know, adjust the rules um, so that there's a marketplace and a value for those products, while at the same time um, having certainty that those products are going to do what they need to do um, at the times the Kaiser needs to call on them. So I think those are two you know, challenges we're going to have over the next few years is to really adjust our rules to take account for the weather and to take account for um, a lot of innovation that's going on. Thank you very much for those comments, Mr. Randolph. Um, we can try to get Mr. Bolton back on the line again, assuming that the line is fixed. Mr. Bolton, please go ahead. How about now? Sounds good so far. Please carry on. All right. Thank you. Uh, apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, Again, um, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I'll be I'll be brief. I, I would say you know the question of the state of play. You know on on Pacific Corp's behalf, um, you know we appreciate the work that's going on across the region. You know we're seeing uh, the West provide solutions that work for the West. Uh, that's the conversation that's that's going on. And you know as as folks familiar with our region know well that. Um, you know, the West contains a dramatic diversity of 
values and political opinions, but we do have common aspirations. And this seems to be a place where, um, you know, we can and should expect progress. Uh, resource adequacy is absolutely, you know, timely. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually sitting here in Washington, D.C. today, and it's cooler and more pleasant than it is at home in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and, you know, the extreme weather events that we're experiencing that have been discussed quite a bit throughout this conference um, is just one more um, strain on the grid, on the system, and, and something that's frankly becoming more and more difficult to plan for. So looking at additional tools uh, to ensure that we can meet uh, our customers' demands and have better situational awareness both within our own system and what's happening uh, regionally is, is crucial for the ability um, for us to make progress. Um, I do want to you know, say real quick that um, you know, Pacific Corp was, was an early adopter of the Western EIM. You know, we highly value the, the work in partnership with the California ISO. There has been, I believe, a, a real proof of concept in the growth of the EIM. We're excited by um, that growth and uh, we'll be uh, anxiously looking forward to um, new entrants, especially the Bonneville Power Administration, which I think will be uh, extremely impactful when they come into the um, energy imbalance market. Um, and this experience only encourages more exploration uh, and frankly some trust to build from uh, to expand Westwide markets. Um, you know, our vision I think is, is fairly simple. Uh, we do think that um, there needs to be additional infrastructure, there needs to be additional technology and market solutions. And above all else, um, this work that we're doing um, has to be explainable and relevant, I think, to our customers and our stakeholders across the West. Um, you know, over the last couple days of this technical conference, the intellectual firepower uh, applied to this question is daunting. And, you know, we have, we have the uh, the intellectual capability, I think, to problem solve and work through solutions, but you know we have to bring um, our stakeholders along with us in this work. Um, you know there have been uh, mentions uh, pre on previous panels around uh, just the, the the reverberations to this day from uh, when there have been market failures and the Western power crisis. It's still. Uh, you know, raised among our customers uh, whenever um, we talk about change. And so as we um, embark on this additional work, which is very necessary, and we do believe we need to move to a more robust Westwide RTO, uh, we can't lose sight of the hard work of explaining those benefits, um, keeping this work uh, tangible and relevant to uh, all of the people in communities across the West and do so with a lens that um, really responds to what we see as emerging concerns around uh, environmental and social justice, that it doesn't have to be beneficial, it also has to be less impactful. And, um, you know, those are the building blocks, I think, for building the kind of trust and durability to this work um, that's necessary to be successful. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Bolton, and apologies to everyone for the slight technical hiccup. Um, back to you, Commissioner Clements. Thanks, Naveen. I see Chairman Glick is back on, and we'll reserve my remaining questions uh, if there's time when, once he's through. Chairman Glick. Thank you, Commissioner Clements, and I want to apologize again for having to step out for a bit, but um, uh, that was unavoidable. But um, uh, again, want to thank you for for uh, participating today and wanted to start with a question and I'm hoping I didn't, uh, this isn't uh, duplicative, but um, I want to start with a question about uh, deference to regional deference and deference to, de to, to, to different players in the region. Um, because we've talked over the last couple of days about the need for common definitions, common approaches uh, to, to identifying and defining uh, resource adequacy and metrics, metrics and so on. And, and, and that's, understandable and it's much needed. But at the same time, we're being told 
that um, it's also important to be to defer to different sub-regional solutions and sub-regional efforts. And again, I, I don't. This is not at all a statement against what the folks in the Northwest are doing. For instance, I think that's um, very interesting work. Um, but I, I wanted to talk about the conflict between those two concepts. Right? How do we ensure a hands-off approach and let you know a thousand flowers bloom when there's a, when there's a need from a resource adequacy perspective? of greater coordination, greater access to data, again, uh, common metrics. Uh, is there a way to, to, to have your cake and eat it too on those particular issues? Mr. White, you're first, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chairman, for that question. I, I guess what I would say is that, and, and maybe um, I may take a different view on it, which is, I recognize there's a lot of different initiatives going on the West, and it, and it sounds like what we've heard over the past couple of days that um, folks are clear in the fact that they want to, you know, kind of an iterative, um, you know, kind of grounds up approach. But I guess what I would say is with, with respect to the, the, the issue of, you know, data quality, data availability, data security, and that kind of consistent approach, um, from, from WEC's perspective, we do believe that there needs to be a consistent approach to really fully maximize um, the, the, the full power of the interconnection, and, and that is going to be necessary because without that um, kind of common language, um, I think we're going to be hindered in, in that approach. So um, I would say that I don't think it's an either or proposition from my perspective. I think that um, um, if, if there is, you know, an, you know, in, in addition to those three areas of data, I would say I would also say um, independent data and data literacy. In other words, um, a data has to be trusted as a former commissioner. Um, that was a big issue. If you're in a docket, you have to understand that the data you're getting is coming from an independent, trusted source. But you also have to understand it. And so I, I would say that um, ultimately, if there's an ad hoc approach or several approaches, several RTOs, Northwest Power Pool, whatever it is, absent a full RTO approach, I believe that um, with a common understanding and agreement on both the load and the demand side, or not the demand side, but, but the resource side, I think that could be extremely powerful. Um, data is going to be the answer um, to many of the questions we have going forward because the, the capacity margins are becoming so thin that you have to know when, how, uh, and how you can count on your neighbors because that's what it's all about. The, the days of having a lot of slack in the line are over, and so it's becoming razor thin. So you have to have that clarity and that granularity in data and understanding of literacy. So that's kind of the way I would answer that question. Thanks. Thank you for that answer, Mr. White. And Ms. Ullman, please go ahead, you're next. Uh, Chairman Glick, thanks for the question. I guess I would look uh, to history a little bit to hopefully help us inform what's gonna happen in the future. When I think about how the EIM was created, there was a willing utility that was in six state Pacific Corps that went to the CAISO and joined the CAISO uh, in the EIM and then then more and more utilities joined, which created more and more savings, which uh, created more and more transmission availability in the system, and, and the savings continued to grow. And what happened is that it, it got to a point where if you weren't in the EIM, you had fewer trading partners. And so you almost had to join the EIM because if you didn't, then there weren't as many people for you to trade with. I don't know that the, that's a great example, but but what when I see the discussion that we've had over the last two days, which I agree has been very informative, there is consensus, I think, that we need to get to an RTO. I think there's great questions about how fast that can happen, um, but I think that we agree that that's the end goal. And one of the things that, that I think is, is necessary is to really try to set firm timelines for actions for whatever piece we're working on, whether it's you know joint tariffs or RA or whatever it is, because human nature is such that when you have difficult issues and you have a lot of time, we make decisions in the last five or ten percent of the allotted time. And what I've observed uh, in the, in the past is that we've kind of made some strides and then things have stalled or there haven't been different. Uh, firm timelines and that if we're serious and we know that RA and having sufficient resources is, is a priority, which I think everybody agrees it is, then we need to get serious and we need to ask our, our utility CEOs to say, what are the timelines, what are the deadlines and make them aggressive. And if we don't make them, we don't make them, but 
make them aggressive. And I think the other part of that is that the commission have a have a key role here. They have been engaging more places like the Western Interstate Energy Board to bring folks together to, to raise that level of awareness. That's a very, very open forum, so anybody can participate there. So maybe that's kind of a process answer, but I think we can get there by looking at what happened with the EIM. It's that, you know, everybody got in because they really had to get in and the benefits just got so large that you couldn't afford not to be in. Thank you very much for that detailed response, Ms. Ormond. Um, Commissioner Tony, you're next. Please go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate this question as well as the similar line of questioning in the earlier panel. This is the uh, this is the needle we're trying to thread, and how do we, uh, as commissioners, for example, uh, keep enough uh, express enough urgency into the processes that we are hearing in our home? capitals uh, while at the same time giving uh, the processes space to come to a good resolution. It, it's something uh, we, we talk about and grapple with. Um, I want to recognize the sort of centrifugal force that Ms. Orman was pointing to. We have seen that really work uh, with the EIM and we see it beginning to work around the Northwest Power Pool footprint and the potential opportunities there. I think the, the underlying challenge is that, is that what holds us back here is we talk a lot about building trust and building trust is slow. I would argue that we uh, go into these conversations trying to figure out how to mitigate all our risks. And um, trust, uh, we might trust personal relationships, but of course the institution is what matters. So personal relationships will change and evolve over time. If we can move to institutions that have balanced governance where the key parties are in dynamic tension and, and likely to stay in dynamic tension even when the system is under stress, so no one party is going to drive the end result. I think we can make progress much faster. And what you see us, I think, feeling our way towards in the Northwest Power Pool conversation and in the KISO GRC conversation that I've um, been fortunate to um, support uh, Commissioner Raper in, is it, trying to find that dynamic tension where no one party can um, swamp all of the others. And of course, we understand structurally why California uh, currently can't get all the way to that uh, balanced uh, governance, and I, and I uh, share uh, Sarah Edmonds' hope that we could. Um, I think we see a challenge in the imbalance in the Western uh, energy imbalance market proposal in the east side of the interconnect in it being um, a relatively imbalanced model today. The SPP full RTO model is different. Um, but I think at the end of the day, if we're not having a conversation, we could get less squishy about trust and more structured about what is going to be a balanced governance model that keeps us in that dynamic tension and lets us build forward, lets us scaffold forward. Um, I like the idea of firm deadlines. I'd note we have two states that have firm deadlines now, and we'll have to um, deal with those as a region, and that will that will create some interesting pressure for all of us uh, to engage in. So thank you for the question. Thank you for the answer, Commissioner Tony. Mr. Ackerman, please go ahead, you're next. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pleasure to be with you. Uh, if I hear your question right, sir, and as, as thinking about it now as a former Commissioner Chairman who, for the most part, focused on state perspective, now uh, with the Wired Initiative at the center, trying to facilitate regional perspective, I think the essence of this is how do you do both at the same time? I think uh, as the West moves forward, and there's been some eloquent discourse about what comprises the West, um, there's going to be a need to allow states to still be states and figure out what they are sovereign over and how they carry out what's important to them. While I think to what Ms. Orman was pointing out, there was sort of an organic nature to letting things come forward, whether it's the EIM or EIS or now the, the Northwest Power Pool, and then in the inherent benefits show themselves and manifest and then as each state filters that through their state objectives they can kind of figure out which piece they they pull upon i think the challenge to that and it's both the challenge for states it's the challenge for the federal government 
is uh, at some point it needs to be uh, forced to be a bit more of a cohesive conversation. There's a, only so much organic development can occur before, you know, it's sort of a petri dish of interesting things growing, but we've got to figure out what are we trying to build toward. And as uh, Commissioner Tawney pointed out, with two states now putting on their state statutes, thou shall join an RTO by date certain, sets an interesting discourse into this as to it's still not clear who actually initiates that to happen. And that, you know, there's trust in that, but there's also the need for it to be kind of, you know, building off of what we've heard yesterday and today of teasing out some of this need for commonality, this need for, for metrics, uh, for a shared vision. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that comes to mind in real time is if the U.S. Congress comes forth with uh, one or more pieces of legislation that have relevance to the transmission conversation, and I'd say they, you know, hypothetically put forth an office in the Department of Energy that now has both authority and resources to make something happen, they are not going to come to each state, most likely, and say, hey, we have resources for you. What would you like? They're going to be looking for a shared voice. And so it behooves the, the West and the, and the states, and that's what uh, I appreciate about the Wired Initiative and about what former Governor Ritter gives leadership to, is how you build that collaborative shared voice out there so that that these folks, both from governor's offices and policies offices, and through the the, the uh, transmission owner operators, the uh, utilities and the like, are already practicing how to build that shared voice to say, this is what we think is important uh, and how we move forward on that. Because uh, I think we sort of all know, and I think Mr. White shared that at the beginning of sort of what we're what's growing out of this of a sense of agreement. But even at that, you know, I don't know if everyone would necessarily agree it is an RTO that's coming to us or where we all agree, what does that RTO look like? And if you asked everyone to define the RTO, it wouldn't be, you know, it's going to be sort of like watching the founding fathers, now founding fathers and mothers sit down and decide the best structure of all this. There's a lot of detail to work out. So we need to build frame around that. I think it involves governor's offices and involves uh, uh, building collaborative voices that say, What's important to us? How do we honor and admit that there are things that are going to be tough, like cost allocation? We put it out in front of us and then find ways to march forward through that. I think that's the key piece. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Ackerman. Mr. Mainzer, you're next. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks. A lot of really important uh, points made uh, by my fellow panelists, but Chairman Glick, to going a little bit smaller picture to the specifics of the question. Um, around common definitions. I guess, you know, from my perspective, working in the West uh, for a long time, I think we know that, you know, I think we know that self-determination and local control are sort of universal uh, human desires, very strong in the West. We've been working with the states, public power, um, many different types of entities for years to try to uh, develop more shared understanding of their interests. And I think this last year in particular, uh, as we've worked to strengthen uh, the sufficiency test, which is a fundamental underpinning of trust for the energy imbalance market, or to just strengthen liquidity uh, between the different regions, recognizing the interdependencies of imports and exports uh, between the adjacent regions in the West, and of course all of us, the primacy of, of reliability. I think we recognize that it's important that we develop some common language, you know, the counting rules, uh, the measures for sufficiency, you know, loss of load probability. And I think there is, I think, you know, conversations like this, I think that FERC has a has a very helpful convening role in pooling the expertise of folks from across the interconnection to help us continue uh, to work together and to develop language consistency. And I think for WEC as well, you know, is that big position sort of looking across the entire interconnection. So I think there are a lot of internal forces of just self-interest and dependency that are pushing us in that direction and the more we can uh, arrange ourselves uh, sharing experiences and looking for ways to establish that lingua franca across this adequacy i think the better thanks thank you very much mr mainzer mr harrison you're next please go ahead yeah thanks um so you know in terms of the question of kind of um how we go about developing um the trust in, in the market just, you know, from our perspective, we, we have over 140 customers and <clears throat> they've all have different perspectives. So, you know, the, the approach that we're taking with the um, power pool on the resource ad adequacy program, I think is an important one because it allows us to kind of go through that thrashing that needs to take place to understand what we're trying to achieve, 
come together around some commonality around metrics, et cetera. And then also just, you know, allow folks to, to begin to build trust through that understanding and potential experience. Uh, absent that, we, we really run the risk of falling into some of the pitfalls that we've had in the past where we get down the road, but we always have one entity or another that's just not across the line in terms of trust and things fall apart. So, you know, whatever we do moving forward is going to be critical that uh, we're able to pull all of our uh, resources together and make sure folks are in alignment and understanding of what we're trying to achieve and what those metrics are. And then also, what's the level of accountability? Uh, we have so many different approaches right now where folks can put one foot in and then pull out when things just don't feel right. And, 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 and that leads to a level of mistrust because we really don't know what we've got uh, contributing towards these challenges if we have that type of fluid uh, participation. And so, you know, as we structure things, we're going to have to be mindful of doing the advanced work having folks understand and get that trust, build that trust, but also graduate towards something that's more uh, focused on accountability and making sure that um, entities are able to stand, you know, uh, forward, whether it's a good condition or a bad condition, because we're all going to be in this together. Um, you know, the, the challenge for us is that in the Northwest, uh, you know, we've been most successful when we do collaborate uh, regionally. And so, uh, you know, getting FERC's continued support, uh, you know, of these regionally developed efforts is, is going to be critical for us as we move forward, particularly around resource adequacy um, or even a potential RTO. Uh, I see that as beneficial. But, you know, we also look at some of the challenges. If you think about the challenges that we have, uh, you know, coordination in the West stems from the diversity of the entities that we have. And, and, and so, uh, you know, you've got public power versus, you know, and, and investor-owned utilities. You've got for jurisdictional, non-jurisdictional, uh, and then you've got a vast amount of operations over you know, various states, uh, and, and actually, you know, three countries. So, if you think about it in terms of how we're addressing this problem, um, you know, these early steps in terms of building credibility and trust are going to be critical for us as we move forward. So. Uh, you know, I think we're moving in the right direction, but I also really encourage us to, to take the time to build that trust as we take on these new um, opportunities. Thank you very much. Um, back to you, Chairman. Thank you, Naveen. I wanted to move on and talk about a different subject, transmission. And I was just, you know, looking out at who's participating today. I think we have the three largest transmission owners in the West. We have Bonneville, WAPA, and uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy Pacific Corp. And um, <laughs> transmission obviously is a big part of the discussion we have. We spent a little time talking about it yesterday, not much. But I wanted to get a sense from you all. I, and, 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 and clearly, I, was, I would start out by saying clearly we need to build more transmission capacity. That's something um, uh, we're, we're trying to work on at FERC. I know you all are working on regionally and, and, and part of the transmission planning process. and. There's all sorts of cost allocation issues as well. Um, but I'm wondering if there are things we can do in the nearer term, as because it takes a long time to build transmission, that would help facilitate an improved resource adequacy situation or at least an improved reliability situation. There was a discussion yesterday about um, contract-based versus flow-based approach and whether we need to take a look at doing something different. I'm just curious if, 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 if anyone has any thoughts out there as to how we can how maybe the transmission system could be operated in a different way to improve uh, reliability during obviously extreme heat waves. Ms. LeBeau, go ahead to your first, please. Sure, thank you. Thanks for the question. So, you know, speaking from a, a, the standpoint of, a, you know, this, uh, you yeah, know, a transmission, um, transmission utility, um, you know, I think there, there's a couple different things that we've been pursuing um, to, to try to gain some efficiencies across across large uh, territories. You know, one of them has been, you know, exploring the opportunity to, to combine rates and make things a little bit easier um, uh, from that respect. Um, I think, you know, you're, I think you're, 
I'm I'm a little optimistic in the sense that for future new build that we have over the course of the last um, five five eight years that you know we've done a pretty good job about permitting a lot of um, interregional projects. I think one of the challenges has been kind of the the lack of clarity um, in the markets and also you know just essentially the commercial marketplace to commit to those projects and so i think the good news is you know we've we've got a lot of good solid projects permitted throughout the west um, to kind of connect those you know regions where that hold the most promise in terms of large renewable build out and and connecting those with real markets and now that you know we were seeing some you know hard targets put in place um, for you know, new contracts, new commercial commitments, um, and and we're also seeing you know the batteries you know the the commercial battery storage um, you know marketplace also those prices are starting to come down. We're seeing starting to see some economies of scale. I hope now um to pair up with those um either on our systems or in you know co-sided with large renewable build out that i think we're going to see some of those projects materialize as soon as those commercial commitments um, get worked out um so i'm hopeful in that sense um that you know we'll, we'll have those um come you know in in the next coming years next couple year or two so i don't feel like we're starting from scratch in that sense um, I think the other, the, one of the challenges I think we do need to think about, and we, we're already thinking about um, from a Western area power perspective, is really kind of how to, um, to, to, the, to the extent that we can better utilize and gain some efficiencies um, from a, expanding or upgrading um, our, our DC ties. That is something that we're looking at right now. Um, in conjunction with the department, in conjunction with our with our um, with our customers and partners, and so I think you know that is also you know another avenue for potential efficiencies. Um, and you know, and certainly we we realize that you know just upgrading or expanding our ties um, will also require um, you know expanding uh, and and, and uh, committing to. Uh, the attendant AC systems, um, you know, those are those are kind of those are some tough cost allocation um, conversations that need to be had uh, amongst our amongst our customers, partners, and potential markets. So, uh, but I do see from a, you know, for there, I think there's a lot of different avenues uh, for new build uh, or, or for expanding or upgrading our current systems to gain those efficiencies um, you spoke about. So, thanks. Thank you very much for that answer, Mr. Go. Uh, Mr. Hairston, you're next. Please go ahead. All right. Thanks. Thanks for the question. I, you know, my colleague Tracy uh, touched on a lot of things, but I, the point I'd like to make is just that you know we talk a lot um, when we focus on resource adequacy. We generally focus on uh, you know resource efficiency, but deliverability is such a key component of this. Uh, transmission is just really critical to ensuring you know, power delivery from resources to load and enable, really, at the end of the day, resource adequacy program and market development. So, uh, you know, if you look at the West, um, it's largely operated by uh, transmission service providers that offer service under oats. And, you know, I think we've taken a big step with through the establishment of Northern Grid because coordination is key um, in any environment. But essentially now, when you have you know, the onset of all of these um, renewables coming on board and decommissioning of, of coal plants, well, you know, you don't necessarily locate them in the same spot. And so you have to figure out what the impacts are to the transmission system, the grid, and, and coordinated planning is essential to that. So, you know, through establishing Northern Grid last year, I think that greatly enhanced regional transmission coordination across the uh, Pacific Northwest and and, and really the Intermountain, Inter, Intermountain West. Um, you know, I think Northern Grid um, brought together both investor-owned and uh, consumer-owned utilities around one common set of data and assumptions, which is also a key component, uh, you know, if you think about the coordination that needs to happen. 
Um, and it also provides more opportunities to identify regional transmission projects which is going to be also a necessary component as we move forward and have to deal with the integration of renewable resources. Another component um, to this is also the cost, right? Um, cost and time, because transmission projects take time, and they also take uh, pretty sizable capital investments. So making sure that we get coordinated around the cost is also a key component, and, and that is oftentimes the, the, the death knell in a lot of these things. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I think, you know, as we develop policy, um, we're going to have to really recognize um, the reality and the interplay between uh, both the organized markets and what we're seeing in terms of the oak framework. So, uh, you know, as we progress, uh, those things have to be considered. And then the last thing really is compensation and the operational protocols that, uh, you know, we have to have in place to ensure customers um, under any model is really served uh, fairly and um, and reliably. So I, I think, you know, just in addition to some of the things that I think Tracy shared, really that cost component and some of the things that we're doing on the northern grid are, are worth noting. Thank you very much for that response, Mr. Harrison. Uh, next, next, Mr. Scott Bolton, please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, Chairman Glick. Um, I'll just tag on to the comments uh, from, from Tracy and John. They, they've covered a lot of the same viewpoints we would have. Um, I mean, clearly, uh, I, I think there's general agreement that um, we have a, a transmission need across the West. We need additional infrastructure, not just for path diversity and reliability, but to help optimize the resource capability of the West, um, whether that's, um, you know, new renewables or frankly uh what we've experienced in upgrading renewables you know repowering wind projects you know has uh you know we've been able to serve up to our already established transmission limits but we know that it looks like a matter of Lost Mr. Bolton again. Um, for the moment, um, we can skip him and then move to Ms. Orman. Please go ahead. I think he's back. We don't hear him. I think his audio is lagging, so we'll take care of that offline. Hey, Scott, we, we can't hear you. Yep. All right, Ms. Orman, please go ahead. I think Mr. Bolton is muted now. Thank you, uh, Chairman Glick. Great question and really a difficult question to answer. I want to uh, just talk about efficiency of the existing transmission system because we certainly need to get more out of what we have. And um, Alice Jackson from Excel mentioned. Uh, flow-based as you did. I think that's a really important component move to a flow bin because we're going to know more about what's on the system where. Um, my understanding is that there are some paths that are constrained. They're only constrained a couple hours here. It looks like we might have connection issues with Ms. Ormond as well. Um, we can just pause the feed capital so until we need to fix the technical we need to issues. These Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to try to finish. I'm not sure if you could hear me or not. I think you're lagging a bit. Can you try again, please? Chairman Glick, the last point I was trying to make was that we have closing coal plants and that that's going to change the availability and use of transmission.
looks like we've lost. Um, do, do we want to try Scott again? Or can, we try um, yeah, can, can we try can Scott again? It looks like we, yeah, here we go. Can you hear me? Are we good? Yes. All right. I'll try to speak fast because I don't know how long it'll last. Um, thank you. Thank you for your patience and endurance. Um, I, I, I think to complete, you know, we do recognize that um, we do need more transmission capacity in the West. Uh, in some ways, transmission may be having its day. It's good to see um, transmission infrastructure as a key component in the president's infrastructure uh, proposals, as well as uh, you know, popular on a bipartisan basis in the Congress. Um, that's crucial, frankly. Um, you know, as you heard from 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 John uh, Hairston, uh, cost of transmission is substantial, and certainly, as an investor-owned utility with retail jurisdictions across six states, we have to make that economic case above and beyond the reliability, the uh, the market expansion, the the other um, ancillary opportunities that come with having a more diverse and robust transmission system. We have to convince our state regulators that these investments are good for customers and they are lumpy investments with the um, you know, significant upfront capital costs. So we are hopeful that you know, transmission is emerging as a national priority and as a key component to uh, being able to accomplish some of the clean energy and economic development goals that uh, the federal government has been articulating lately. Thank you, Mr. Bolton. Back to you. Uh, Thank you, Naveen. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, one last question. I want to turn back to Commissioner Metz and, and uh, also other colleagues as well for questions. But um, uh, I, I know that last uh, last August, obviously, uh, we had a couple of days in rolling blackouts in California, but there was continued hot weather after that, and the conditions may have even been worse in some cases. But as I understand it, demand response and other action, action actions were taken, but demand response was a big part of the reason that didn't uh, you all didn't have to impose additional blackouts, um, Mr. Manager. But um, I'm curious about your thoughts about the contributions of demand response to resource adequacy, or at least in terms of, I shouldn't say resource adequacy, but to at least in terms of preventing uh, certain actions to be taken, such as rolling blackouts during extreme weather conditions. And uh, what else, from a FERC perspective, do you think there's anything that we can do, or do you think that's mostly uh, a, a, an issue, a state-by-state -state issue that needs to be addressed locally? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman Glick. So from my perspective, um, you know, demand response is just an absolutely essential part of, of California's research strategy, both in the short term, uh, I think in the long term. I mean, obviously this summer, just today, uh, learning on the lessons from last summer, we've launched a major statewide uh, education around the Flex Alert. We deployed Flex Alerts last week. They worked quite well. So that's a key element of sort of consumer conservation. We're also working hard to enable the third party and response providers to start playing a bigger role in the market. You know, these are the folks like Home Connect and others who come in and actually compensating consumers for lowering their consumption during that those net peak hours. We're starting to see some real promise there. And of course the industrial side remains a key component as well. Uh, Mr. Randolph and his team at the UC have it have put together a whole new program for this summer, an emergency load reduction program uh, with new pricing that we think is going to be essential. So certainly getting scarcity pricing right is critical. I know that's an issue uh, that the commission has focused on. You know, we've made changes to our tariff recently in that area is really essential. And if you expand the definition just to flexible load and supply side and you look at, you know, distributed energy resources in general, you know, where you're pairing demand response and battery storage, that area is going to play an absolutely essential role in, in California's future, and I'm sure for many others. And so Order 2222 is, is critical. And I think for us, what we're doing right now is we're trying to make sure that, you know, sort of our gateways into the market for these resources are as efficient as possible. And then really 
actively working downstream uh, with the load serving entities in California and the third party service providers to make sure that any residual friction uh, from point of connection all the way into market is eliminated. So I, I would say that we're absolutely fully aligned. The demand response is a, is a critical part of our resource feature. Thank you very much for that response. Mr. Randolph, please go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah thank you. And, um, um, you know, kudos to, um, to Elliot some on some of the leadership he's taken at the, um, the CAISO to resolve some issues uh, demand response providers um, have had in the past and were identified coming out of last summer. Um, I, you know, I, I get a lot of feedback from some of those third party providers that they're um, quite optimistic on um, some of the, the future prospects in California now. Um, the, and I agree, demand response is going to be a critical issue or a critical um, part of the portfolio going forward. And as I've, I've said earlier, I think there's some really innovative products um, that are starting to come out there now. Um, and folks um, taking advantage or companies taking advantage of smart thermostats, other automated devices, um, conversations of as we move to uh, more electrified homes using the hot water heaters um, and other tools out there as automated devices to demand response. So that's all out there. And there's a lot of um, um, potential out there. Um, the challenge you know, we've been facing, and I, I think it's true across the board and is to be considered on the federal level as well, is oftentimes we're trying to, to take these new products um, and treat them the same as old products. Um, and, you know, in California, trying to put demand response um, products in the energy markets as if they were a natural gas plant. Um, and they aren't. Um, and they don't have the same attributes. They have very valuable attributes, but it's not the same attributes. Um, and so it makes it really challenging when you're trying to um, build new market rules around them and new resource adequacy rules and new counting rules. Um, and the way I see it for some of this stuff, um, we may need to look at different ways to find that value chain for them, um, for folks to make money off of them, other than some of the traditional ways of them bidding into um, a market. And we've seen some California load serving entities um, uh, being creative with that. Um, they're keeping it small. Um, I think a word for the day has been incrementalism, um, but they are um, um, are doing some experiments with um, this summer and next summer um, with some demand response products that are more focused on, re you know, counting towards reducing their overall load forecast um, and not as a um, as a resource that bids into the market. And that may actually create a clearer value stream for them. Thank you very much, Mr. Randolph. Mr. Chen, back to you. Well, I just want to again thank you all for participating today and want to turn it back to Commissioner Clements. Thank you, Chairman Glick. Uh, I have one question. We talked about lots of different things going on in the West. We talked about um, the energy imbalance market, and we talked about Weiss was mentioned. On transmission, we have Northwest Power Pool. Um, excuse me, we have Northern Grid on resource adequacy. There's an effort in Northwest Power Pool. Each one of those areas has its different governance, and it seems like each time we talk about building trust, we're talking about starting again to build trust around that set of government governance. And we appreciate we have models that are more or less acceptable from different stakeholders' perspectives. I guess when we think about taking next steps beyond these discrete issues um, on on all of those fronts, especially towards ultimately one or more um, regional transmission organizations. How should we think about that? How should we, you know, it doesn't seem as, as efficient as it could be um, to, to have all those different places be centers of, of decision making on these various issues. So I'm curious to get perspective uh, from you all as to whether or not that is an issue. Mr. Rue, please go ahead. You're first. All right. Thank you, Chair. Sure. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Clements. Great question on governance. So, you know, from our perspective, governance is really key for these regional organizations to be effective. 
Um, you know, the governance needs to be broad. It needs to be um, very inclusive in the stakeholders, you know, from all parties. And, you know, regional transmission organizations or regional markets are going to be very diverse, you know, from the small entities to the large entities to the, you know, the public interest organizations to the state commissions. And having a governance model that's very engaging for all those participants is, is really one of the, the foundations for an RTO to be successful. Mr. Randolph, please go ahead. You're next. Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe a little bit be answering a prior question, but kind of on this question on building the governance structures and um, building trust, um, I think one thing that's important that, that has gotten missed, and again, at least kind of in some of the conversations in California, um, is that broad reach of stakeholders that I think Bruce just mentioned. Um, um, we can do a lot to build trust of the people who are on this call and, and the types of people who monitor FERC proceedings. Um, but, um, you know, I can, I, I'm sure this is true in every state in the West. I can list a large list of stakeholders um, who are not part of these day-to-day -day conversations um, and oftentimes get brought into the conversation late or kind of don't get brought in the conversation at all and they just find out when the final decision is being made and <laughs> they don't have trust because uh, they weren't part of the conversation all the way along. Um, and, um, you know, in, again, each state's a little different. The legislative processes are different. Who has authority to um, allow decisions to go forward are different. But, you know, in California, um, on some of this regional stuff, ultimately the legislature plays a role um, and there are a lot of stakeholders they listen to. Um, and, and so I, I do think beyond building trust among the utilities, among the PUCs, among the governor's offices, you know, we also need to look to the environmental groups, um, to, um, you know, chambers of commerce, to um, labor organizations, you know, to all these other groups that look at um, the energy system um, is very differently than we do, and they may see it as a jobs package um, or as um, a economic redevelopment package for their community or as um, continuation of years of, you know, systematic environmental um, racism, um, you know, and so these folks need to understand and see the value of these regional organizations as well, um, or they're going to scuttle the conversation at some point. And I'll say again, from California standpoint, I, 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 we have two governors who have um, been, you know, very supportive of regional organizations out there and movements under those governors um, to try to create more um, regional efforts. And the PUC has been very supportive of that over time as well. But with those other stakeholders, you know, you need to find that time to build a coalition. Thank you very much, Mr. Randolph. Mr. Harrison, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for the question. I, you know, so there's a couple of ways to, to look at this and, and, and how we've been looking at it. Also, I, I would say the so the first thing I'd like to say is uh, there was a comment uh, made earlier by my friend Scott Bolton that suggested that we were already deciding to join the EIM. Uh, we're going through the process and we're in our final phase of making that decision. And, and, and I would say an important element of that decision is governance, is, you know, um, how we look at governance and how that's going to affect our ability to participate in not only that market, but other markets as they develop. Um, I think it's important that, you know, as we develop, uh, take this opportunity to de design a program like the um, Resource Ad Adequacy Program with the Northwest Power Pool, um, that we take that opportunity to develop a governance structure that is sustainable moving forward and is a really good example to all of the other potential entities um, that are out there or markets um, in terms of how we operate. So, you know, that's one of the things that I've encouraged in that forum is for us to take this opportunity to demonstrate what sound governance uh, and participation looks like. Um, you know, is it reasonable to anticipate a future with multiple frameworks, uh, you know, and, and for resource adequacy programs in the region, um, yes. Um, and I think it will be important for um, the various programs to really collaborate on common metrics and uh, 
sufficiency, uh, sufficient transparency, uh, you know, a level of granularity that works, and quality to evaluate the uh, reliability across um, the interconnect. So I, I think it's going to be important for us to really line those things up and rules governing, you know, all of these different resource adequacy programs and resources should be consistent um, across balancing authority areas. I, you know, that's, you know, how we line things up across BAs are, are going to just be critical to the success of uh, multiple programs being able to coexist uh, because, you know, rules in one balancing authority impacts others. And if you look at, you know, what's happening state by state uh, with clean energy programs, um, that's put additional pressure on balancing authorities to really accommodate any conflicting requirements. So, you know, I just see it as vitally important uh, that we have those considerations, uh, you know, in play as we move forward and, and look at regional um, resource adequacy program development. Thank you very much, Administrator. Um, Ms. Foreman, please go ahead next. Well, Commissioner Clements, thanks for the question. Um, as a non-governmental organization or a public interest organization, I think we get pretty frustrated with some of the discussion that goes on because when I step back and look at what we know now, because of the state-led market study, we know that a full RTO will save $2 billion for customers. And so every month there's delay, every year there's delay, the customers in the Western Interconnect are paying more than they need to. I totally understand that governance is a very challenging issue, but at, at what point is a decision just made? So to me, we have to look at some of the good common elements. You know, we, we need independence of an organization. We need uh, state, uh, state regulators to have a key uh, place at the table, but to allow the perfect to be the enemy of the good and to look for the system that um, is perfect, I think is not the right answer, to build the best we can, to look at the governance models that are all over the country and the world. Um, this has been done in other places. So I, I know it's important. It creates winners and losers. It's change. It's threatening. But delaying and delaying and delaying should not be an option because we are getting less reliable because the weather patterns are changing, because our energy systems are changing. And at some point, we just have to make a decision to move forward. So I appreciate the question. Thank you very much for that, Ms. Orman. Uh, Mr. Ackerman, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, if I hear, I hear in your question on governance, uh, the aspect that uh, much of what happens in the West in, in these conversations is sort of a premise that uh, yeah, there are a lot of efforts underway and we sort of hope that there's an evolutionary path that we're watching here and we sort of, I think, trust uh, the word that was used earlier, that incrementalism or that this evolutionary path will, you know, the best will emerge out of that, that we're learning the, the best principles, for example, for this. Uh, history probably shows that incrementalism seldom wins the day, though. It's usually be something wildly disruptive that then says, okay, we need to act now. And I think we're trying to avoid that. Uh, I think what comes out of that, for me in the governance conversation, is you look in a circumstance like with the EIM or EIS, where everything showed clear winners, and they still would needed to make sure governance was in order, but that the risk was relatively low. You put that on one end of the spectrum, and then you put uh, something of a full structure where we're going to now talk about cost allocation, especially for existing transmission assets, uh, let alone new assets. And there, you know, the risk is so relatively high, and as Ms. Orman was just pointing out to the winners and losers, that's where governance becomes hypercritical because now folks are kind of feeling that there there's an existential threat to them. And so I think there's the need, in my opinion, and often, and I was a former commissioner, I was often intrigued with the need many times to step away from how we created tariffs and try to break free of tariff history and understand that there were new paradigms at play. And I think uh, there's the need for some some leadership here to uh, think about tariffs as a form of cost allocation. And how do we acknowledge that there are folks who, you know, that are in a certain, they have a basis of that tariff makes them whole today. How can we affirm that? But Bill, you know, I've often thought that many times we need a a longer horizon for how we look at tariff planning and tariffs to understand that yes everyone will acknowledge and to the extent possible 
still on our kind of make whole or cost of service, but we need to look at this over a time horizon that allows us, us and everyone, the us is a critical piece here in tariffs, we know who that is, but in this larger question about who's going to design the organization and for and, and put it forth for everyone to join. Um, it's a it's a broader question of who does that, but in that circumstance, how do we put forth new ideas about tariff design that allow us to get some range of motion to get the the, the toughest issue in all of this, and that is cost allocation, out in front of us so that we can uh, find some creative solutions, even possibly sort of you know referencing Justice Brandeis use. Uh, use the states as labs on this and try some small examples of how you let short of doing it all at once. Are there other ways we can start tinkering with, with different approaches to rethinking cost allocation as a way to break free? And then out of that, I think uh, governance follows from that. Uh, I think governance is the, is the controlling mechanism for the degree of risk or concern people have in what the outcomes are going to be. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Ackerman. Mr. Manger, please go ahead next. I guess the perspective I'd like I'd like to offer is is sort of a lesson that I think I learned uh, you know, several years ago um, when I was still working up in the Northwest, uh, when the region was really grappling with in the early stages of, energy, of the energy balance market. And I think when when Pacific Core uh, decided to take that really important move to join in with the CAISO to establish the EIM. It was it was such an important shift in the dynamic and established, I think, the precedent for me of, of the importance of maintaining momentum and keeping things moving, even as we try to solve some of the bigger pictures, while the West starts I mean, clearly starting to converge around a longer term vision. We're watching the legislation. We're listening to the way that regulators and utility executives are talking. We know there is a strong interest in continuing to evolve greater integration. For me, what the way that we're handling this right now at the California ISO is really around trying to maintain some momentum. So I think, you know, in late July, and early August, there will be a very important vote coming to our board and to the EIM governing body about joint authority. Uh, this will be a significant, uh, meaningful step forward on governance change uh, for the EIM, which we know is incredibly important uh, for many of those participants. And I think that our hope and expectation is that that will really un unlock our capacity to take that next significant step forward towards greater integration. We all know that, you know, there's, and we're already thinking now hard about what an enhanced day ahead market looks like, looking at the from the last couple of years, trying to, and trying to build some down some of those those barriers around participation and sufficiency and, and some of the other issues. So what we want to try to do is, as we can need to think through these bigger issues, uh, Ed Randolph alluded to some of them inside of California, very nuanced and important perspective that he's identified. I really hear that. Uh, we want to continue momentum and making progress. All of our utilities, particularly our EIM entities, the ones that exist today and ones who are even scheduled to come in in the next couple of years, have been very clear to, with us that they want to see progress and they want to keep moving and they want to be advancing the ball. And that is something that has really resonated with me. Uh, and we are really you know, mobilizing uh, inside the ISO on both of those fronts to keep our progress. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lazer. Commissioner Tani, please go. Thank you, Naveen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Thank you for your patience with uh, my technical issues. Um, so I, I want to echo uh, Mr. Randolph's comments in, in the sense of stakeholders need to be engaged um, beyond just the narrow group of stakeholders that would engage in a, in a close, uh, in the weeds, uh, process, even in a stakeholder process that is as open as the kinds of stakeholder processes are, and we heard some praise for that, uh, for their openness in the prior panel from uh, Fred Hewitt. And I, and I think that, that it, it, that's critical because it, what we see happen in states is that those frustrated stakeholders, those stakeholders who don't um, trust the outcome, who um, think they're what they didn't get a fair shake or their agenda wasn't addressed, either one, uh, then uh, go to the legislature and uh, otherwise pursue uh, avenues that are pretty disruptive to the outcome. And I think 
who, whichever governance we arrive at for whichever footprints we have when we're uh, as we're moving forward, if we don't bring those stakeholders in early and really listen to them, we will uh, deal with um, that uh, disruption constantly, and that will e continue to erode the uh, progress we make. So I think it's a it's a walk into chew gum sort of challenge. We have to bring them to the table. Uh, and we have to build that process into whatever governance we have so that we have sustainable outcomes in the long term and we can continue to make progress uh, apace. I think uh, on a narrower or, or more zoomed in um, level, the challenge has never been that we don't understand the opportunities. I, like Ms. Ormond, I'm deeply frustrated by the money we're leaving on the table for customers. Um, the challenge has always been that the risks of joining up together, of handing over control, feel so much bigger, as, as Jeff put it, existential, compared to the potential benefits. I've heard um, a staffer in a, in, a P, in a PUC in the West put it as, well, I can put up with the governance of this institution, or I can save 50 cents a megawatt hour. Uh, Forget it. It's not worth it. <laughs> and that's deeply fret, right? That's leaving so much on the table. And I think what um, I would ask is that, the, is that FERC and my colleagues and the stakeholders around the table um, recognize they have to get to balanced governance. We're all going to have to give something up, and we're all going to uh, have to have a shared position um, around the table. No one of us is going to get to um, dominate the successful, resilient inst institution that can accomplish all those economic benefits. Um, and I hear uh, echoes of getting to that in the Northwest Power Pool's proposal around RA. I like a lot of what I hear um, Sarah Edmonds putting forward and a lot of what I see emerging because it puts forward that balanced model. No one group um, really is going to dictate the outcome, and so we all can have some confidence that at the end of the day, there will be a relatively balanced uh, result uh, and that the benefits will be shared. Um, and, and I think also, I think last of all, we have to recognize that the risks we're trying to protect ourselves from when we say we're going to stay arm's length, Commissioner Cordova pointed to how uh, in the face of the Western energy crisis, everyone went back to their corners. They went into their silos. That didn't protect us in very meaningful ways from being impacted by our neighbors' actions. And that's why we're back at this table, because even though we aren't in institutions together uh, with formal rules, we are still impacted every time one of us makes a choice. And I think in some ways, we, we have this fantasy that we've protected ourselves and the reality is we haven't. And in fact, if we could have balanced governance and everyone at the table in conversation, I might actually be able to protect my customers better. By engaging in the EIM, I am better able to protect consumer interests than I could without the EIM there. And I was still being impacted by California's intra-hour um, duck curves. And so I, I think we have to let go of the fantasy we're protecting ourselves recognize we need balanced governance, give a little bit up, and reach for those economic benefits, um, but not ask too much of our partners, not ask that each, any one of us be able to control the institution that comes out of the other side. And I would say that time is not on our side. If we don't figure out how to do that, what we'll end up with is sort of little tiny RTO footprints that, that buckle under their own weight. And that will, will still have wasted all of the, the economic opportunity, and that will be a poor outcome as well. And so I think we need to move with all urgency and recognize the reality um, and get comfortable with it. Thank you. Thank you for that, Commissioner Tony. Mr. White, please go ahead. You're next. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner, for the question. Um, you've, you've asked the, the essentially the the question about governance being the stick in the spoke of, of progress on this issue for the past 20 or 30 years. Um, I, I would like to take the opportunity to maybe couple my answer to this question um, and, and maybe harken back to the question uh, from yesterday for Commissioner Glick, because 
there has been um, people kind of dancing around the issue of, of you know, what WEC, what could WEC do? If only there were a independent um, organization with a WEC light perspective who wanted to collaborate and focus solely on reliability and resource adequacy. Um, I don't have all the answers to that, and uh, certainly not with respect to governance, but uh, I do would just offer that, you know, we um, have a long history with working with a very broad um, group of stakeholders, uh, five different classes, government, end users, large transmission owners, small transmission owners. Um, we we are, are ready to have that discussion. We don't have the answers, but we do um, understand that this is going to be an, potentially an a la carte approach to how to look at this. And I think it's what it's going to take is to really sit down with um, as the broad of a group of stakeholders as possible and to really um, figure out what that might look like. We could do that by our power of convening, um, but we just offer that as, with respect to our, our ability to be independent and to, and to be flexible on how that might evolve and what that might look like going forward. Um, again, we don't have those answers to that because our, our typical role and our typical lane um, did not involve this, but this is not the typical um, energy economy going forward. And we recognize that we have to be flexible, flexible and evolve and potentially think outside the box. And so I just wanted to make sure that I answered the question that you posed, but also the question that Commissioner um, Glick pro, um, posed yesterday that um, what could WEC do? Um, we don't know exactly what that might look like, but it could be something more we're willing to have that discussion. So again, I just offer that up and I appreciate the, the, the question again. Thank you very much, Mr. Wright. Uh, Commissioner Clements. Thanks. I'm so glad I asked that question. What what informative perspectives. Thank you for that. Um, we have probably time for one more question. And in light of the fact that um, it, we have such an esteemed group here today, I'm just going to ask, is there anything you haven't said yet that you think we should know that you think should be on the record relative to um, these resource adequacy issues uh, and the regionalization issues related to them uh, as we close today? Commissioner Tony, you're first, please go ahead. Thank you for the question. I appreciate it. I think the one piece I would put forward is um, what we arrive at in the West to seize from the coalitions of the willing that can go out and seize the economic opportunities can conquer their fear of the risks or manage through those risks with their governance approach will look different from the economists perfected view of an RTO. And I think that's because we're building, we're coming to the conversation sort of um, at a different moment uh, in time than the other RTOs formed. And there is a different uh, infrastructure in terms of legislation and so on in place. I would apply the 80-20 rule. We can likely get 80, 90% of the same efficiencies. We might do it in a little more bumbling way than the economist's perfected vision. But if it's politically sustainable and resilient to shocks to the system, if it can have sort of a um, uh, concentric circles approach where it's the momentum of each footprint is starting to draw in outliers, I think that will be a, a huge success for our customers and, and um, will be real progress that is achievable and, and that I can see a path towards. And so I, um, I hope there's room for some um, innovation in, in applying the sort of economist, economist perfected view of an RTO to whatever institutions we do manage to pull together to cooperate in the West and uh, appreciate support in figuring out how to get the vast majority of the benefits um, back to our customers. Thank you very much, Commissioner Tony. Um, up next, we will have uh, Ms. Ormond. Please go ahead, Ms. Ormond. Thank you, Commissioner, for the question. And I want to associate myself with Commissioner Tony's comments because I am right in line with her. I, I guess I look at where we are now, and because of the situations that we're in, where we're tight on energy in in the West, and and weather is just becoming incredibly unpredictable, and we have changing resource mix. 
we have this moment in time where resource adequacy has kind of risen to the surface of of the challenge. And so to me, there's two pathways, right? The, the one pathway was discussed a little bit before where it's business as usual, people uh, balancing authorities build, build more generation. They have to have more reserves, which are incredibly expensive for customers, and they kind of build the silo. The other direction is to try to go the resource adequacy ways, to try to say, you know what, we do care about costs for our customers, especially coming out of COVID, and that we don't want to build 18, 19, 20% reserves because they're so expensive. And so we, that pushes us to share. So I, I think we've we've achieved a lot. We've made a lot of progress in a short period of time. And I just hope that that can be maintained. Thank you very much for those remarks, Ms. Ormond. Uh, Administrator Hurston, you're next. Please go ahead. All right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And, and just want to thank the Commission for the opportunity to talk about this important subject today. Um, just, you know, a couple of notes here. One is that I probably, thinking more on the incrementalist side, um, I, I think we've made some really good progress. So we do, we all acknowledge there's a burning platform. Um, you know, we've got some challenges with the integration of, uh, you know, renewable resources and the decommissioning of some of the uh, coal plants. Um, and 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 so we've got a challenge here, but but I think you know taking those steps that build us towards um, that broader picture are, are important. And an initial step in my mind is you know what we're seeing with the EIM and the participation there. Um, as I noted, uh, we'll make a decision in the fall, uh, you know, on participation in the Western EIM. Uh, we also see potential options. Uh, for future market development being considered by the region. Um, you know, those are active discussions that are taking place now, and, and we think they're important. Um, you know, we'll evaluate those opportunities with input from our public power community, um, our customers, and, um, you know, other regional partners. And, and I think having that discussion is important. But, you know, the EIM, um, coupled with what we, you know, have in place with Northern Grid, and then the um, Northwest Power Pool Resource Adequacy Program, I think are key building blocks to um, giving us the experience and building the trust to moving towards that broader discussion of an RTO. And, you know, and when you talk about a resource adequacy program, you know, decisions about costs and benefits of those programs and ongoing participation, um, you know, for us, that's going to be made incrementally by all of the potential participants over the next two years. And so, you know, we'll get into a non-binding and potentially binding um, scenario, and, and we'll learn a lot, and we'll build a lot of trust potentially. And beyond, you know, the reliability and, and governance, I think a key consideration for BPA and our customers um, who pay for, you know, our cost through power rates and transmission rates is really going to be compensation. Um, how appropriate is the compensation uh, for, you know, the, the valuable federal assets that we bring to the table, um, no matter uh, which market we're talking about, whether it's resource adequacy or um, you know EIM, uh, we're going to want to make sure that we're seeing um, you know appropriate compensation uh, in those scenarios. So I think you know just in terms of things to kind of walk away with, the coordination is essential, uh, but we're also going to have to go through the progression of building trust and then also identifying what is the proper consideration in these in these markets for, you know, specific resources. Thank you very much, Mr. Harrison. Mr. Wu, you're next. Go ahead, please. Sure, thank you. I just wanted to mention that uh, SPP is working with the WISE participants uh, in their evaluation of expanding the SPP RTO into the Western Interconnection, uh, looking at a March of 2024 launch. And an important aspect of that would be SPP uh, engaging with the Northwest Power Pool Resource Adequacy Program. So while we would be uh, optimizing the DC ties between the West and East, it would also be very close engagement with Western Interconnection for the benefit of not only the SPPRTO, but other participants in the Northwest Power Pool Resource Adequacy Program having uh, greater resources available to, uh, to handle anything that occurs in the Western Interconnection. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we have Mr. Ackerman, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, you know, as a former 
commissioner, and the part of being a commissioner that was often I found the most interesting and intriguing was that it is a it is a laboratory on unlike most anywhere else of how decision making is done. It's a fascinating model of both uh, art and science of dealing with complexity, theory and practice. And I bring that up because uh, I found that many times when you found when you were confronted with decisions, there would be a history of what the criteria usually were. And you'll have staff, legal and others who will tell you what those criteria are. And, and you will, without knowing, sometimes feel the nature of it constraining you that the decision is over here. And I would uh, just encourage, and as future decisions come that have an impact on the West or the Southeast for that matter, where we're trying, where folks are trying to figure out what comes next, is to entertain the idea of, of a criterion as to how does this decision either further a better coordinated regional market or impede that or possibly isn't relevant to that, but to bring that in more and more overtly into those decisions. I won't tell you which proceedings to apply that to, uh, but <laughs> unless you want to hear advice on that, but no. Uh, but the point being, I think there's an opportunity there to remind you know that, that that power, that position to steer this, not toward the specific conclusion, but to say to folks who come before you, this is something of interest to the commission. How are you furthering this? And, and how has that become part of the decision-making process? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ackerman. Uh, Ms. Lebeau, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I think, you know, thanks for uh, allowing us to kind of share some uh, final thoughts. You know, I think we're, we're all aligned here that better coordination and efforts <clears throat> as we plan our uh, resource adequacy is going to help us make some s significant progress in one of the areas. And John Hairston um, touched on it uh, very well in the sense of, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, on the behalf of our customers that we you know, capture and identify the you know true value of hydropower in this in these evolving markets. I mean, every year we're losing more of the stability that makes a resilient system possible, and also leaning on hydropower as a a real baseload type of resource. So I think the other aspect of you know the the valuing the valuation of hydropower is also you know, also recognizing it that you know it really is uh you know it really is unique in the sense that you know we can also provide black start um, type of services so i think you know capturing that true value of what our federal assets bring to the table i think is going to be it's definitely something that we're uh, keeping a close eye on I, I do want to thank, you know, the commission uh, who has been, you know, very innovative and diligent in working with us. I mean, I want to think back to 2015 when uh, we worked with the commission um, proactively and were able to find a way to uh, have uh, WAPAs, our Upper Great Plains, uh, part of our Upper Great Plains system, um, become the first power marketing administration to join a market, um, which has gone very well for us thus far. And then lastly, I just want to you know, um, um, acknowledge and um, extend my appreciation to the Commission as well for um, also keeping a sharp eye. And we touched on it a little bit um, during this conversation, but also kind of keeping an eye and a focus on uh, energy uh, justice and equity issues. Um, I think the inclusion of stakeholders, um, you know, is, is important. We've touched on it. <clears throat> but really kind of going further than we have in the past. And, and, and I really hope that as we kind of go, you know, as we really deliberate on, you know, what our, our shared path is going forward, that we ensure that we take the time. And I, I believe there is interest, in, and I've heard it in the conversation today, to ensure that, you know, we, we, we learn the lessons of the past and we include um, as much as is, you know, feasible and, and, and possible, um, those voices that sometimes we have not sought out before. So I uh, really appreciate the, um, the time today. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lebeau. Uh, Commissioner, back to you. Well, thank you all. Um, Thank you all for the time and the perspective today. We really appreciate them. And we're just about um, at time. Uh, I'll ask um, Commissioner Danley, do you have any questions before I move to uh, closing statements? No, no questions. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And, co and Commissioner Christie? 
Uh, no questions. I want to thank everyone uh, both days. Very interesting commentary. You did a lot of work on this. Uh, our staff did a lot of work on this. Uh, very productive uh, two days, and I really thank everybody involved with it. So thank you. Thanks. I guess, Naveen, in closing, um, I'll say that I appreciate the perspective that all of you here, I think, are trying to be part of the solution to this really complex system set of challenges. Um, and, and that's very encouraging uh, to hear. Uh, I, I appreciate this idea that each time something new um, comes forth, it does require time and it does require beta testing, it requires trust building. And when we sit here in the East and say, oh, but this, we know how to do this kind of market, that's what you do. That's, that's not the situation. And so that's, that's real. And I also appreciate the scarcity of resources for, for stakeholders who want to participate and influence the outcomes to make them better in those proceedings. I think that sits next to the reality that, you know, we're, we have, we are leaving efficiencies on the table. The Utah State study shows up to $2 billion a year annually by 2030. Um, and, and that's a lot. And, you know, our job as economic regulators is to ensure just and reasonable rates. And so these just, you know, cost savings are not just nice things to have. At some point, they become critical, uh, required even. And at this end, also, um, we're looking at a really changed uh, landscape under our feet relative to reliability. And, and that I think you will probably go to sleep thinking uh, more about that than I do. Um, those things together make this really urgent and so anything that the commission can do to help narrow and make more concrete where the actual problems are i think it you know we talked um mr ackerman was brave enough to mention cost allocation of existing system uh resources those are the kind of problems that are they're real we know they're coming whenever they come right and we we can we we can't guess perfectly who has to pay for what but we can start thinking about the scenarios under which we do that and as we start to have those conversations alongside actual steps, I think that is helpful to, um, to, to keep the ball moving forward. And I think that's a place where the commission can be helpful uh, on these issues. So um, with that, I, I'll, I'll thank you for um, joining today and then um, hand it back to you, Naveen. Thank you very much, Commissioner Clements. Um, and well, we're approaching the end of the conference uh, for this day. Thank you again on behalf of the Commission for all the participants. Uh, of course, I think uh, we found it very beneficial and I hope you have as well. Maybe sorry to interrupt. I just realized that um, Commissioner Christie did provide closing comments. I'm not sure if Commissioner Danley um, has had a chance. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I, I think in closing, other than thanking everybody, I just want to say that I can tell that there are many people who are quite enthusiastic about establishing the most robust system they can as quickly as possible. But as several people have commented, the watchword of today is incrementalism. And I would caution that any stakeholders who are interested in moving ahead do so thoughtfully and deliberately. Um, but that is just one man's opinion. That's all I have in closing. Other to say again, thank you to everybody. I truly appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Clements. Thanks. Appreciate it, Naveen. Um, did Commissioner Christie have any closing remarks? Right, well, if not, um, then uh, sorry about that. Let me continue. I just wanted to thank everybody again for um, attending this conference and hopefully you found it as useful as we did. Uh, thank you to the FERC team that put this conference together and all the um, IT support that we had. We apologize for the technical glitches that we saw, but thankfully, I think everybody got online and was able to answer the questions and participate in the discussion. Um, thank you very much, and we will adjourn for now. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone.